Hello everyone and welcome to This Nintendo Life episode 204. My name is NBZ and uh, I am back and so is Bally and uh, we're changed by many things, Bally more so than anyone, uh, <laughs> because Bally is now officially a married man. Bally, how does it feel? Feels very good. It has been a busy month of all like the wedding planning and then we went away to the Lake District for our little sort of mini stag do with some pals, which was By very God, fun. Yes. Made it back in one piece, and then a week later... Just about. Just, just about. about. And then, yeah. uh, having dipped into Lake Windermere twice, uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. we made it back to Edinburgh for the wedding the following week, which yes. all went swimmingly it was, it was really nice the weather came out it was incredible yeah. like edinburgh scorching sun in at the end of august which is not honestly given. yeah you you could not have asked for a, a better uh weather setting for that day it was yes. it was really perfect so worked out so also say mm -hmm. well done to mbz for a mm. very impressive best man speech i think Thank everyone you. everyone was incredibly impressed definitely like, wasn't so writing well that last minute and stretching the week beforehand <laughs> definitely was not the case yeah of course oh, uh, my speech was very last minute as well it just yeah like, i think we both we, we both were like i was like oh have you done yours and i was you're like no i haven't written it down yet i was like okay cool yeah that tracks <laughs> yeah we're all good here <laughs> makes sense uh but no it, it all worked out uh, i think it was good in the end so glad uh, to have it all done and uh, now we can just focus on playing some video games right that's that's what it's uh, going to be for the, the rest of the year i'm looking forward to it uh, and boy howdy do we got some video games to talk about today before we do that though balan do you want to tell the fine folks at home uh, what we're going to be talking about on the show for this first segment we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing the second segment will be some of your emails that you have sent in and then for the third segment we're going to be talking about the cost of gaming, um, and there's also mm. an announcement, or a rumour, I should say, about the Switch dropping uh, its price. Uh, yeah, potentially in Europe that might be happening, so we'll see if that stays the case. But yeah, an interesting discussion to be had about playing and purchasing video games. Uh, but talking of purchasing new video games, uh, we have done just that, Bally, with the new release uh, that has hot off the presses just come out, WarioWare, get it together. Finally, they are releasing a new WarioWare after what feels like probably a whole generation. Um, if we go back to it, I want to say like WarioWare DIY or something on DSiWare is probably the most recent WarioWare iteration that Is that a, a legit staple WarioWare? It, so like it carries the WarioWare name at least, which Game and Wario did not. Um, so you could theoretically put Game and Wario within the scope of the series, yeah. but it is definitely not the same thing. I guess WarioWare Gold is the most recent, right? Exactly, and that has some new games, but it's not a wholly new game. Mm. That that's mainly the greatest hits, right? It's what they did with Rhythm Heaven. It's it's taking all the best stuff from the series and putting it together. Um, and wow. I picked that up for super cheap last year uh, and had a good time with it. I really enjoyed playing back through some WarioWare again. Reminded me uh, how fun the series could be. Um, and so yeah, really, it has been. If we're talking about like official mainline WarioWare, maybe it's Smooth Moves on Wii. That's the last proper one. Um, so it's been a goddamn That's long a time, very long time uh, since wow. a official new proper WarioWare game, um, and uh, we've both played it. We both finished the main story. In fact, did you play through the whole thing co-op with Caroline? Yes, played through the whole main campaign uh, with Caroline and co-op, nice. and then we just had a little look at some of the multiplayer games. Not all of them, and okay. they range between two player to four player. Those multiplayer games. So we just had a look at some of those, just like the simple Great. like volleyball and the soccer ball stuff and nice some other yeah ones. i mean one of my favorite memories of WarioWare is that table tennis game on ds where we would hold it together <laughs> yeah. and what one person would be on one screen one on the other and it was just good yeah. fun multiplayer T touched I... is still like in my mind one of if not the best not the best warrior i think we can yeah talk about that later, i think but, nostalgically like... probably my favorite yeah, that, in some that ways toy um... room on that in that game was mm. fantastic just so many like toys mini games silly little things to play with that utilize the touch screen really cool yeah, for sure. Um, so I think when you talk about WarioWare, you always have to talk about like what is the thing with this game that sets it apart? What makes it 
uh, unique. And gimmick. usually what Nintendo does is they they have a system-wide gimmick for their console or, or handheld, and that is the thing that they rely on to do the mini game. Mm. So obviously with Touched, it was using the touchscreen. With Smooth Moves, it was motion control stuff. Uh, with Twisted, they had the, uh, the kind of gyro uh, built into the cartridge itself. Um, with Mercury, I want to say, which is why it never came out in Europe and had to be in America to buy a copy, which I believe we both own a copy of Twisted, right? Having yes. bought it from the US. Yes. Um, we managed so, yeah. to smuggle Mercury into the UK. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, which I think you can actually get Twisted in, in the UK now if you buy it via the Wii U eShop, because I think it's on Wii U Virtual Console. Um, might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's that's a good way to play Twisted if you want to. Uh, I would say Twisted, probably the best WarioWare game overall, yeah. if we're to yeah. Rank I'd probably them. go with Twisted, and I'd probably after that might go for the GameCube slash GBA one. I guess yeah, GameCube one totally. has got those multiplayer games in it. Oh so. man, the multiplayer modes in the GameCube game are just stellar. Like stellar. so many fun, different. I, I remember watching Giant Bomb a couple of years ago play that mode, the Doctor mode, where you have to like do and say <laughs> stupid so stuff stupid. as you do the mini games. And oh, what a fun! Like if you have the right group of people together, that can be such a a hoot. So um, so for sure that makes sense. So getting back to this game, then what is the the gimmick i guess because it's called get it together you would assume that it was about co-op and that definitely is the case right because you've played through the game co-op but more so they've really changed up the way in which you approach the challenges by adding a bunch of characters who are from the series but the first for the first time you can play as those characters so kind of a weird setup at the start it's interesting having come off warrior gold because warrior gold has like a fuckload of voice acting for some weird reason and like long cutscenes with every character like full-on talking like maybe the most charles martinet has ever the most lines he has ever spoken in a mario style <laughs> game uh, is in warrior gold whereas this one starts off and they're like ah we're in an office oh we just got sucked in the video game and then you're just off to the races and to be honest the story is like very small little bits of dialogue in between levels it's not much to it it's very thin mm. and that's totally fine because i'm not here for that in warrior wear i mean some of those cutscenes are still on the long side it's like they are on, let's get on and play with the game kind yeah, of thing yeah they, they, they hew a bit more towards like silent movie comedy style mm. stuff as well that doesn't make a lot of sense but it's just there as flourish i guess um but yeah the difference is this time all those characters get shrunk down to kind of like mini chibi size and they all have unique ways of interacting with levels or moving around so wario for example has a kind of uh, hover backpack that he flies around in so you can move him around wherever and he has a shoulder charge so he can go forward uh cricket is the most conventional character he just jumps he can run and jump and that's about it um, and then you get into more complicated characters like 18 volt who he can, he can shoot lasers i love 18 he volt. can also like attach himself to these little rings and, yeah. and that's how he moves around the level because otherwise he's just sitting still like on his ass he can't move himself yeah. so you have to move him by like attaching to these things that will move you around the level he's a lot harder to use as a result of that and i and I, I did find with all these characters i gravitated towards the ones that were just plain better like ashley for example mm. she can fly around anywhere and shoot anywhere in any direction and like just as a way of interacting with any possible micro game she is just probably the best choice because of all the options she has makes it so much more easy and approachable versus mona who moves around of her own accord but then you have to press it to throw a boomerang that, that you then remote control and it just feels like there's a lot more chaos with someone like her or even nine volt who just moves on a skateboard and the only interaction you have is this really thin yo-yo that goes up making it really hard to nail some of those like fine aims that you have to do um so personally i i, I like the idea and i think it's really cool when it came down to it doing all the like high score chasing i just find myself using all the characters that are really good as opposed to the ones that are tricky and i'm, I'm interested to see if, if later on there will be more incentive to kind of uh use those harder characters but um i'm interested about how you how you feel about this new approach to the series and, and whether you think it's a good change and and if it's like made the game more replayable or, or enjoyable for you I, I really like it actually i think it at first you are kind of like right well some characters are clearly better than others but certainly in terms of the story mode that kind of will force you to use certain characters later or certainly when you... every t well every time you unlock a character or yeah. it's every time it's their level you're locked into using them uh and mm. then you can add a bunch more it's like a a set usually of three to begin with but then it ramps up to four and then five by the end of the game but, but even at um, the end of the story mode there are some characters that you have to use for the entire 
thing like very infrequently but you remember like penny's level yeah so, like, so penny's yeah. is unique um because she has like she's probably from my perspective the hardest character to get your One head of, around yeah, definitely. um because she sprays water but the direction you spray pushes you in the other direction so mm. if you want to go left you have to kind of hold to the right and you also can stay in the air and hover but you have to remember to do that because sometimes you'll want to push on something and you'll forget to hover but then she's getting pushed back in the opposite direction and so you end up missing the shot you're going for so yeah a lot more cerebral in terms of not only you have to think fast for all the micro games but you also have to be like oh right i'm pay- playing as this character i need to quickly adjust to what is their move set again um and it, it becomes second nature after a point of like ah oh, yes i know exactly what to do but as you're building more characters in your roster it's definitely a bit of an adjustment period yeah sure. I, I think clearly the game's not particularly well balanced when it comes to like all these characters and it, the fact you are given the option to like pick four different characters and all four will be on your team and then it will randomly go between the four within any given level means that like you know you do have a lot of leeway to just as you say pick some of the best characters but even the characters like 18 volt so he just stays stationary and can shoot these rings off the top of his head in any direction that you select. And as you say, he can like latch on to these other golden rings to move around the level when he has to. I found that for like 80, even maybe 90% of the games where you'd use him, he'd, he'd make the level much easier. But then for the, for the 10% where he did struggle, he would struggle massively because like you are. Yes. But So I really enjoyed gambling on him. Any level like there's a level where you're in a building, you have to get to the top of the building to leave on a helicopter, right? That micro game pops up a lot. And for 18 volt to get there, you would have to do a, multi, a string of multiple right. rings to attach to to get up there, which makes it a lot harder for that particular yeah. stage. Yeah. Or there's someone's but, like cross this gap and then he has yes. to like attach to the ring, whereas Warrior or Ashley just fly over the Happens. right exactly um, yeah trivial but, but then there's some um levels that require like you need to break out of this jar or something yes. and like warrior smash can intermittently do the shoulder charge which is great and ashley's uh wand can intermittently cast magic but then for example if you're 18 volt he can much more rapidly just you can spam it can't you right you can just wail on his ability to smash out of the the jar so i do love that mix and kind of push your luck kind of element of which character shall i pick which one shall i go for um i I think the whole idea of just like a 2d not 2d character but like you're almost platforming in a way on the front of the screen interacting with the game in that way i think it's very clever and i'm glad they didn't go for like motion gimmickiness Mm. with the or like joy con sideways yeah like and to some degree they've painted themselves into a corner with the switch light because they just they can't guarantee that you'll be able to do that with a regular switch yeah i wonder yeah you're right maybe that played a role in like what made them decide to go for these you know figures instead of right utilizing joy cons which as you say with switch light is just completely pointless like Mm -hmm. playing the whole through campaign like in maybe three four hours with caroline like it i i had a blast like i thought it was yeah. warrior where at it's near its best or if not at its best and like for caroline who'd never who didn't know anything about warrior wear so oh great i was so we have this thing with, with caroline where i will pitch to her like oh do you want to play this game and i described okay. the game to her and this famously i described rocket league as it's football but with cars and she was like <laughs> That sounds absolutely dreadful. I do not want to play that game. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, 30, 40 hours later, she absolutely yeah. loves Rocket League. And so when right. I described um, Warrior Wear as, yes, yeah, like, like five second micro mini games, uh, she's like, that sounds awful. Why would you want to play a fi- Why would anyone want to play a five second game? I think was her, her quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said, well, they're really fast. You need to work out what to do. And like, it's, it's mad and it's fun. And then when I showed her the trailer bef- just before the game came out, she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll play this co-op campaign with you. Let's, let's do that. And when I told her it was like three and a half hours or whatever, she was very keen. So I, I think she was, I think she liked it. I don't think she loved it, but I think right. she thought like, this is, this is cool. Like I, I, I'm enjoying this. So yeah, nice. I think we had a great time with it. Yeah, for sure. And and I have uh, gone on to try and unlock all the micro games, right? Because what inevitably happens with a WarioWare is that they force you to stop after you beat the boss level. So the first time you go through, you get like 10 or 15 
uh, micro games in a row that you beat and then you fight a boss and then the story continues and you can go to the next level i basically did a just full run through without going back to any of the levels previously so that once everything's over you then go back to them and then you can start going for high scores because the game doesn't stop you after the boss level it just continues onwards and if you beat a boss level you you get one of your lives back if you'd lost one which is always a good push and pull of like oh can i just make it to the boss level i got one life left if i beat the boss then i can get another life back which can continue my streak a bit longer like how long can you go for becomes the meta some really creative boss levels as well i thought really really cool stuff yeah so i was actually gonna say i didn't like a lot of the boss levels in this game Mm, um i think in the past there have been some really good ones i think of the the shoot at the top kind of um like gradius style shooter where you're shooting uh um fingers two fingers to destroy noses and like the two fingers like go into the little nose creatures and then there's a giant nose that's a boss touched yeah that was good yeah that's a really good one there's also the skateboarding one i remember where you have to like duck and dodge and jump over things and i really liked those i found some of these to be a bit hit or miss um in terms of the bosses like some of them are a bit slow there's the i can't remember who it is but there's the one with the safari where you just go on a safari and you have to it's a like memorization games where you see yeah yeah there's some zebras and then there's some giraffes and then there's a hippo or whatever and at the end it asks you three questions about them and none of them are super difficult and even at the hardest level it's not it's just too slow i think for a, for a boss and the same with the one where you open the drawbridge like it just takes a bit too long to do oh i really like that one i think it's it's fun. I th- maybe it gets better because I haven't um, done the later stages of that one, but the first stage of it, the boss, I was like, okay, this just... I mean, it's quite fun in co-op as well because we're like opening the bridge together, closing the bridge okay. together, that sort of thing. So Yeah, maybe that does help. more co-op focused. And, and some of them um, felt a bit jank, like the rock climbing guy with Jimmy, especially because Jimmy's motion one, right. is really weird. So doing it with him the first time round, I thought this is terrible because it's, it's so jank, like getting that hand to move to a rock and then it's like playing Quop third hand like you are the actual person moving the it's like that game uh, mount your friends that giant bomb played a lot where you have to move all your limbs to like get up uh, onto the top and, and get the highest possible but it's as if you were a separate entity controlling the limbs which it just fell apart for me it was yeah. much easier later when i had a character like warrior or ashley for example or orbulon who can just float around made it much easier to connect those but um but that in particular was one first time around i was like oh that's a bad boss i don't i just don't want to do that one again i um, really so. like the one where you're making the like juice and you're squashing berries yeah and, that one's all right actually uh, and that's really fun in co-op as well actually and then you play it later in the story modes as well actually which is much tougher but it's yeah i think it's a cool idea yeah there, there's some cool ideas in there i do think that um overall for me the boss is a little bit weaker but again like bosses in warrior has always been a weird uh concept and thing i i maybe would have liked it if they didn't maintain that and maybe shook it up a little bit more um but it is in terms of what you come to expect from you go in you play 15 then you get a boss and then you play another that are faster and it's the same core formula as it's always been just throwing the twist in of the different characters um to to spice it up a little bit and um and yeah i i agree i I think i had a really good time um with the main campaign i'm enjoying it even more now because now i don't have the constraints of you know which character that you have to use like you can do any team members you want you can just get your best ones and then also i really like that there's two options so you can do your uh your picks who you want to bring in or you can do everyone on the roster and it will just mix in everybody and those are two separate leaderboards which is really nice so your scores will be different depending on if you went your own choices versus everybody um and everybody's obviously a lot more tricky because you don't know who's going to be in there there's like 20 or something characters that could be thrown in at random um so i I appreciate that they separated the scoreboards for that stuff doesn't seem like there's any online stuff for those though in terms of your main Mm. campaign scores i didn't find a way of of, like seeing a friends list or, or stuff like that um because there is a mode that is different called Wario Cup. Uh, I don't know if you tried this yet, Bally Wario Cup. You unlock it after you finish the story. No, I just I just did story mode and then tried some of like the multiplayer modes with Caroline, but I've not looked okay. at the other other modes. So Wario Cup is basically a weekly challenge, um, and I don't know if they'll add more and more as as they go on. But at the moment, there's only one, and it is really fun because it is the fastest possible speed, which is insane 
playing as nine volt and you have to do i think 25 games back to back and if you fail them it's fine you don't have any lives it's just how many successes can you get can you get all 25 of these without um losing any lives and then you'll get a ton more points than if you didn't and it's based on a point system so that you can look at the worldwide leaderboards and and see what like bracket you got into and stuff like that and then it will also show you your friends list to see how well your friends had done at the time when i did it there was only one other person on my friends list who had done it uh, and i had just narrowly beaten them um so i didn't have the motivation to go back to it but now probably a lot more people will have finished the campaign and, and started that how, how many out of 25 did you get not many like 13 or something it was a it was not a great that's quite a lot for like the fastest possible though it's not... yeah and when i say fast as possible it's just like lightning like you can't even <laughs> blink it is and especially with nine volt because his He's gimmick is yeah going he just goes back and forth on his own and you have this tiny like thin hit box of his yo-yo so like hitting the exact thing you need to like you have to nail it first time that otherwise you're fucked that's it like you, you failed the minigame um so so yeah that that was really fun i i can see myself going back to that and, and really doing a lot more of it um i would say i'm disappointed in the lack of kind of little toys and bo hmm. bits and bobs that you can unlock it doesn't seem like this game has those i think that was one of the reasons twisted especially is so good because yeah. the the gacha machine in that you you put your coins in and you spend them on that and you twist it and you get mm. um like a I weird mean, mini game or or stuff like that at the end of it maybe it's harder to create the toys when there isn't as much of a gimmick like a lot of the touched yeah. toys and the twisted toys are to do with both the twisting and the touching the touch screen yeah. so that's but true I, I agree it might be it might have been fun to like have some more mini games or stuff that could be it, it feels like the they screen. lent a lot more on the co-op games for that so it, it, for me i don't have someone at the moment who i can play local with in terms of those games so a lot of that content is just locked off right like there's some of it you can do single player but for the most part they are two to four player games so it feels like they took that stuff and decided oh we're just going to make this into a multiplayer uh, thing instead um which is a shame for people who are who are not able to do that but um I think that's probably what their decision was because otherwise I would have expected there to be like and a lot of the times it was stupid shit like here's an alarm clock that's the color blue and you've got a red one and they're all like the same mm. thing really but there's an egg timer I remember actually at one point uh, when my mum was cooking something back in the day and I was younger and I'm like oh yeah I've got an egg timer on WarioWare let's use that uh, so, so that you can make this uh, this egg uh, properly boil it um, in the water for long enough um, so so yeah, that that kind of charm of those little knickknacks is missing. Um, what has replaced it is this thing's called Prezies, which to me feels a little bit like Spirits in Smash Brothers. It's just like shit that doesn't really matter, that there's, you can collect a billion of them, and then you feed them to your characters. And so, like, I fed Wario, and now he's a level 15, and he's like a CEO or something, and your t the titles of them change, and, and, and now I can change his skins so now i can like he, i can have a golden wario in my mini games instead of a regular looking one and you can uh. change the color palette by unlocking different colors and you unlock gallery artwork for all of them but for me that's like kind of more superficial stuff as opposed to like the uh, airplane micro game which i might have spent a, a couple of hours on and posted high scores on and stuff like that back in the day which that was, was a very very good one that was yeah that was great yeah those those were really fun and and so for me it's a, it's a tad disappointing that they don't have that stuff that said if they if they beef out the the wario cup challenges and, and do leaderboard stuff with that i think that's probably a a good idea for like extending the life of this game potentially yeah, because yeah. really like this game's super short you can beat it in a couple of sittings yeah, and yeah. and it you know it, it provides a bunch of fun but really the long tail with warrior wear is is going back into the levels mm. um and doing high scores and for me and, and it always has been like I it think always has been yeah. going in with an expectation that you know there would be a ton of content and other modes and things like that like they, they've always been fairly light on the modes i think the gamecube version is maybe the most mode rich especially when it comes to multiplayer obviously but i think as you say the core thing about WarioWare is how much you enjoy those micro games and beating high scores and if you like that then this WarioWare I think does that very well and the, I think the micro games are, are fantastic as always really and yeah we haven't mentioned the uh, Nintendo ones but that's always my yeah. favorite thing with a new WarioWare really is um is being surprised at the pulls they get they should make a nine volt spin-off that is just nine volt games or something like ab so fucking lootly like, that would be incredible 
Yeah, just like the 9-volt collection. Take every 9-volt micro game from every WarioWare there's ever been and just uh, and add a bunch of new add ones. Add a bunch that... and just call it, yeah. Yeah. That'd like, be, if you want to do awesome. DLC for WarioWare, there's an easy idea for you, Nintendo. Of course, mm. they'd never do that, but like, oh my goodness, I would buy that day one. Uh, that would be so fantastic. Um, and yeah, the, obviously, I think a lot of the joy is the surprise of the first time you do a micro game because yeah. it's just like uh, this terribly drawn fucking MS Paint guy. <laughs> uh, he's in front of a bunch of soup and the soup is cloudy, so it's uh, fogging up his glasses. Move the soup out of his way and then he'll be happy. And like the animation on it is so jank and, and ridiculous because it's supposed to be looking terrible um and i love that i just love how there is a real deliberateness in the garbage art that they create for warrior Wear micro games mm. it's just like there is something uh it's really ugly yet beautiful at the yeah, same time it, yeah totally it, it's really just such a great thing i love i love that that stuff is is in the game um but yeah i uh the moment i'm really enjoying uh going back and posting those the scores i my current high is a score of 81 i just had a killer of a game um i believe it was on uh dribble and spitz's level um and just m- mad dash just absolutely nailed all those those levels and right that's the score to be i'm gonna i'm gonna do it yeah i i do want to post a score over 100 on some of these um and there are like mini missions like pseudo achievements that they have that you can get coins for completing and those often are like oh get over 31 so i i definitely i want to get over 31 at least in all of them which shouldn't be too difficult it's is generally like if you're decent you can get that in warrior games but for me the end game usually of warrior is going to the mix-up stages at the end where it's every micro game in the game randomly thrown at you and mm. that i think is where the real like i want to post high scores on those like get over right. 100 on, on those ones um especially like the really hard ones like the the one that in the story mode only requires you to finish five micro games to complete it um that yeah. one that's where it gets really intense and if you can mm. get like over 25 on one of those ones you're doing really well for yourself because that's it just starts to become insane and, and really hard to control because the the speed just ramps the speed just gets mm. Uh, mm. out of control um, i think debatably and i need to try more games to see if this my theory sticks that when you are moving like a character and you are playing you know get it together rather than the original warrior where another warrior where it arguably maybe takes longer to like move your character or shoot your thing or do your thing I think in, so. the, in the game do you think yeah, so i do think so yeah. because there is an is it because it's an added layer and they, they mitigate it a little bit like remember on the wii where they would have to show you the pose every yeah. time before a game which <laughs> yes. slowed it down somewhat um they do a similar thing where they show you which character you're going to use and you have a little mini area where you can move them around and like remember oh oh right it's dr craig or i have to hold down yeah. the a button yeah. to to swim through the I air swim through the air because I'm i love that weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, he has yes. so many funny moments like in the story where he just like will swim on into camera into shot and it's just very very funny like i laughed out loud quite a few times when i when yeah. he appeared dr Krigel, a super strange character who is now on this microphone that i'm talking uh into because <laughs> i got a bunch of stickers with it and i decided i'm just gonna stick dr Krigel on the side of my microphone because fuck it he um it, it fit so it was good um do you have any favorite characters or like interesting moves that you you enjoyed as you went through not necessarily mm. the ones that were the best characters because i think like people like orbulon i really enjoyed and ashley in terms of their usability because they're very you can just float around anywhere i you liked orbulon because he seems weird like just floating around at the top of the screen like shooting downwards i don't know but I, yeah I, I yeah i really like 18 volt i think it's just hilarious the idea that he sits there and you can just fire from a single point is very fun mm-hmm. um and then i did i i really liked mike because yeah he's simple and easy to use but i think character wise and in the story and things he's just very funny and has some funny one-liners and is like has mm. a very british accent in a weird way i just i just find that hilarious yeah and he's he's also one that can float around but yeah. only shoots up the ways that they, they, mm. they seem to like have constraints on some of these characters right like there's a, a later character who drops bombs and, and floats around right, right um i don't want to spoil the final character of the game but let me just say what a great what a great final character for this game i, yes. I thought it was like what like honors the history of warrior wear in a really cool way yes. um and yes i that character 
I have played as a bit, but would like to play as more because I'm like, they are a little weird and like this works because this is the way that they work. But um, but yeah, I, I was surprised by that and I thought that was a really neat um, addition. So so yeah, um, I don't know. How, how do you feel in terms of how much you're going to continue to play this game? Do you want to go back through and, and see all the yeah. micro games and stuff I, like that? I would. I mean, I've obviously got a lot of my play at the moment with other games, but I, I, I do want to dip into this and just try and beat some high scores, try and beat your high scores. Um, uh -huh. Just like see what else the game has to offer. Like um, I might try, like me and Caroline might see a couple of friends in uh, next week or week after that or so. And they... they have a switch and we might try some four four player stuff might might oh, get nice. out of the warrior yeah. where see if they enjoy some of the four player modes um, that'd be good yeah i don't know but yeah I'd, I'd like to play more and i i I think this is a good warrior wear for someone who's picked up a switch that hasn't maybe played other warrior wares i think i think all of them generally are quite easy to get into and if mm -hmm. you've got if you've played video games before like there is a certain gamer logic to a lot of these games i don't think it's right. the easiest thing to just shove in your parents hand and say play no, this because i think there's a not. lot of you know um video game lit liter literacy to yes. kind of how the games operate but it it's good i think this is a good one to pick up yeah i really like it um and i'll, I'll keep checking in with it and um and trying out those challenges weekly and, and that sort of stuff and uh and yeah i uh i hope uh it, it does okay i hope this people uh check it out and um and give the series a go because i think uh if this does okay i don't know if that affects rhythm heaven at all ballet i just want some way to bring rhythm heaven back you know that's that's, that's what we're doing here so. yes yes we'll see um cool uh let's move on to a game that we've talked about very very briefly um recently is a uh, probably about a month ago now since it came out but finally we have both played a bunch of it i have finished uh, and you are almost at the end of axiom verge 2 the sequel to uh, Thomas Hap's Axiom Verge that we were just chatting about before came out about six years ago, we realize now, which is actually a pretty damn long time mm. uh, when you consider um, the, the time between games. So it happens uh, when one person works on the game, right? It does. <laughs> it yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, and he is, again, the sole creator of this sequel um, that includes the music and, yeah, as we were mentioning before as well, fucking banger of a soundtrack really absolutely good soundtrack. fantastic i was um, especially in the um what's the alternate world called the, the breach in the breach, the breach yeah. yeah very very good music because it's like there, more chip tuny versions yeah, really of, cool. of those really those cool. songs um yeah so I, I talked about the briefly the start of this game and i was i think i was having a bit of trouble getting into it at the start i don't know how you felt when you first started the game but I, it's, a, it's a rough start i think both yeah. from an exploration perspective and just enemies overwhelming you it's yeah you don't have much to fight back with and yeah it's pretty brutal at the i start, think sure. i think at the end of the game it said i had 22 deaths and i want to say probably 15 of those were in the first couple of hours of the game right um, because that's a very low number of deaths generally for like a yes. metroidvania yeah I, I think that's down to the priorities of this game which is not combat really like you do have the ability to kill enemies and get health back and stuff but at its heart this game is really an explorer's dream right really it is, exploration it is, focused. It, it is so focused on getting traversal abilities and going back to places on the map to to see if you can get further in that space that you weren't able to before and really that's kind of the core of what metroid games are so it, in a way it's one of the purest metroidvanias i've played yeah um, this, i was gonna say this is the metroidvania for metroidvania fans and i think tom yes. Hatt knows exactly what he's doing where yes people love games like i don't know ori and hollow knight and all these things but and yes they are they are like, i prefer those games as metroidvania games totally but th you can tell that this is very much for the metroidvania hardcore that are into they're not into the running and gunning and the platforming necessarily they're into the actual thinking and how to get from a to b and the puzzle solving aspect of ex exploration in relation to metroidvanias which i think yes it's arguably something that's kind of faded away from a few metroidvanias especially mm. when you think about i think of games like i don't know gato roboto metroid fusion that are a right. lot more linear and i mean ori in many ways is quite a linear game generally yeah i mean you can choose like the second game you can choose which area you go to but it's always clear where to go and, right. and, and how to get and there, i think right? that that very sort of super metroid kind of working out where to go feeling which i think the first game is very like replicates and does its own thing with very well um yeah. in conjunction with the running and gunning this kind of replicates all that exploration feel but then takes away a lot of the running and gunning 
which I think really gives you as the player a chance to kind of stop and breathe and think and you know kind of think right I've got these really unusual abilities and maybe we can get into some without spoiling too many of them yeah, but just yeah. like really unusual abilities to traverse the world look through walls or you know go into the breach and different ways of accessing the breach and it's really kind of brain busting stuff but in a way that while a lot of it has been a little bit too difficult for me and i've had to look at a guide maybe a few times mm -hmm. there's still been plenty of satisfaction up until that point where i have managed to work out right that links to this and this links to that and it's like that is a great itch to scratch that i haven't scratched i feel like in quite a while with a lot of metroidvania so like this game is absolutely hitting out of the park when it comes to like problem solving and getting from a to b i think it does a great totally. job when you get in that groove of like you've just got a new power up and you're like oh i cannot wait to go all over the map and figure out where do i go next because you have so many options now that you previously have seen this thing and you're like oh but this lets me bypass all of that stuff that i wasn't able to do before mm. it i think it works so well one because the map is contiguous so it's not broken up into pieces like the original axiom verge was um, and similar to super metro when you go back to super metroid you realize oh brinstar norfair meridia they're all separate maps unto their own and like you traverse between them via elevators and stuff like that mm, they have this map e is, exits and things yeah yeah this map has like no loading screens between areas no. it's all one area if you were to count that it would be going into the breach which is a separate map unto itself mm. um but the ability to fast travel and how early on or not not necessarily super early but you get it at a point that is a really great point in the game where you have enough of the map uncovered that it is so much more convenient to now be able to traverse all these other areas you've been to so like the excitement of ooh, i just got the ability to climb up the side of walls for example which is an ability that i really enjoyed and thought was great at opening up the space like kind of taking from what breath of the wild did but doing it in 2d to some mm. degree like having that ability to because there are so many surfaces throughout the game you're like oh if i could get over that with a double jump that'd be great and you realize oh instead of doing that he just let me fucking hang on the wall and just climb up the side of it which is uh, even even better now that you have the ability to fast travel i'm, I'm just looking at the map and I'm like okay that's a blank area i haven't explored that's one that's one that's one and i'm just pinging around the map via fast travel just quickly checking out is mm. there something here did i get an upgrade uh, and all that stuff and it is so satisfying um, yeah to do that stuff. I, I know you've not died very much i've probably died a lot more than you and i think sure in part i've been treating aspects of the game a bit more traditionally trying to take on too many enemies when often it's, okay it's better your time is better spent just avoiding a lot of the enemies but yeah. i will say that th what the game does so well to reinforce that ex exploration loop is you keep all your abilities when you die you keep yep. you, all the map remains uncovered when you die like nothing 100%. you all you're losing um when you die actually is resetting you back to and the story kind of plays on to this in, in, in part but yeah it, you only reset back to a checkpoint essentially and, and when i say checkpoint that's not not even technically true it's just a point further back but everything you've achieved up till that yeah, point it's just like a save area it's the, it's the last area that you saved so you've achieved you've still achieved everything you did up until yes. the death uh, and up until your and, death and axiom so. verge one actually did a little bit of this which was i remember fighting one of the harder bosses at the end of the game and i was like fuck this thing is kicking my ass and i finally killed it but I also died at the same time. I was like, oh, fuck, no, I'm going to have to go back. And I killed it, but I died at the same time. And I went back in the room and the boss was dead. I was like, yes. Oh, I, I, I had that with one of the pseudo bosses in this game, actually, where Did I was you? worried okay. and I went back and I got I still got the power up. Um, yeah, you got yeah. the bottle or whatever I, you I, get I, for it. Yeah. In, in conjunction with the bosses and the power-ups i think the power-up system is really nice where yes you're just given these points quite a lot of, like at the start it's obviously quite a few points but by the end you're picking up like double capsules and yes you're rolling in points at certain points and then you can you can put them into so many different abilities uh i've really enjoyed putting them into the hacking ability in, in right. particular and like expanding that um that you, you're like radius on that and i actually try i actually thought you might be able to like trick the game into opening some doors early by expanding oh, it full that could I, be cool I, you yeah. can't 
to my experience, Damn. you can't at least. Um, so maybe that was a bit of a waste early game. I feel like someone's going to figure that out. I feel like that's the sort of thing that Tom would put into the game as like he had a speedrun mode in the original game and has one in this as well. So right. I do wonder if there is something like that point. or some yeah. weird yeah. shortcut that is built into the game design mm. in some way. Because um, yeah, it's definitely it's in the lineage of uh, the genre that like speedrunners love, right? Super yeah. Metroid is like one of the the speedrunning games for people mm. so. so so i actually really like the point system because there's just so many different abilities to put your points in but I it also, always feels satisfying as well right? even even yeah. when you kill a boss you're like oh yes i got another bottle like and every time you hit it like it pauses and does the little mm. pixelization i really love all nice the pixelization stuff yeah. in the in the game like when you re- respawn at a checkpoint and it all the pixels like pop out and reform you as a body and stuff like mm. that really nice looking stuff and i actually really like the pseudo bosses in this game where you mm. know a, a lot of them are at dead ends a lot of them are often like where i'm at in the game they're not that hard to beat most of them and it's a case of like scanning them uh, like hacking them essentially making them less powerful and then just kind of finishing them off often and you'll get your like point capsules things to upgrade your 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 um skill tree or whatever and it's very satisfying like and, and lots of them are just kind of plopped and strange dead ends and things around them i bumped into one earlier that was like two next to each other and oh, each wow. of them were the, worth like two capsules each and they were right next to each other and i managed to beat both of them there and then which was very satisfying so i like that they're kind of these optional things that you can yeah you can beat them and get more capsules and that's great but you can also bypass them and i think that as much as the skill tree is fun to upgrade, I think the game is still very playable and beatable, arguably, without a lot of those upgrades, which I think is always a sign of a, a well, well-designed, well well-structured game, although more health is always valuable, I guess. But yeah, totally. I think it, it, yeah. it works really well because it, it's your, your exploration isn't nerfed too badly by not upgrading those things. It just the things that you do have become better right because all because all the traversal abilities are the ones that you need to finish the game so you'll get those by course of playing the game exactly um so that makes sense yeah i um i think the bosses were an interesting thing because in in many senses they aren't they aren't bosses they're just kind of big bigger enemies they're just Um, big enemies with big rewards i guess yeah yeah and i think thinking of them like that makes it makes me feel better about them because there were certain ones where i just went into a room and just like smashed the melee button a bunch and they died and yeah. i didn't really have to dodge yeah. anything and they just kind of done they just I, they still have the beautiful animation of like bursting into those uh, obscene mm. uh, pixels but um i think the most interesting one was in the underwater area the giant snake underwater guy yeah very early game very early game but also you had to use your hacking ability to turn off the kind of steam valves all across its body and i did that and i'm like well i still can't hurt this thing what do i do how do i take it down turns out you have to use your kind of earthquake ability to trigger these um stalactites on the ceiling to fall down onto it so they do the damage and so it wasn't really a fight about um my dexterity or my ability to like hit it and dodge out of the way it was like oh i have to just figure out what i need to do here and so it felt much more like a puzzle boss in that way um, and it wasn't particularly hard to do it was just me figuring out what do i have to do in order to take this thing out and that for me that was the most satisfying encounter in the game when it came to fighting enemies because it really spoke to the design of what the focus of this game is which is more curiosity and and exploration than it is pure combat um and I think, like, early on in the game, I was a little down on it because of, like, the axe feels very piddly and the type of enemies they throw at you early, you have to, mm. like, duck down in order to hit them with your hitbox. And I, I think the early game could have been designed in such a way that might have just made it feel a bit more welcoming. I don't know whether that yeah. would have been just give you a better swing on an axe or a sword or to just make the enemies a little bit more nerfed in some way or something. Yeah. Because it does feel very brutal and it's in stark contrast to kind of the late game where you can not breeze past enemies but like you have a lot more at your disposal to just kind of deal with enemies i don't know yeah yeah for sure i I think it it makes the wrong promise at the beginning i think is Mm. the issue right like it it makes you think it's going to be the same as the first game in terms of its priorities which means like you are fighting a ton of enemies and you're trying to get to the next save point without dying and then once you hit a certain milestone you realize oh i can just run past enemies i don't need to engage with them and really you can do that in in regular metroid style games because enemies don't give you experience like they do in castlevania for example right so it's, it's not necessary but um but yeah it it i think 
could have made it a bit more of an easier up ramp because there is like i have fought bosses in this game that are mandatory however you can't die there is one boss that you fight um that happens like somewhere in the middle of the game and it's by a save point and if you run out of health the save point will just reform you and put you back on the ground again and so really this game can be beaten even if you don't engage with the combat at all and don't want to get good at mm. it i th feel like the plot is telling you that in that fight right it's like yeah totally the point yeah right and it, it, it leans in with the mechanics and narrative in that sense because mm. because this world you are able to just be reformed your body yeah. when you die your body just you don't actually die you just get reformed i wish i understood what was going on <laughs> i do also you do find a lot of notes around the yeah, world and the, they feel the, super nonsensical and hard to pass the world is really cool and i just wish the story was a little more simple for me to understand right. um it's just a it just feels like a very complicated story and yes the, the notes are very explanatory but they don't seem to they're very hard to understand and yeah it, yeah there's a lot going on in this game for sure so like Udug this and like these are the arms and they like live inside your brain they, they talk mm. to you sometimes and then someone does something and runs away and it's yeah it's it's for me a little bit of a mess narratively but probably my fault for just not paying attention really and not and not wanting to really care about yeah, it yeah. which often is the case with me as we all know um but <laughs> yeah I, I did find it just hard to pass and so after a point i was like i'm just not going to try anymore i'm just going to pick these up and move on with my life because that's not what i like about the game like it, it's yeah. there for some people and i'm sure some people will get a lot out of it for me the lore and the, the world is like whatever mm. it's, it's a means to an end really um and and yeah the end is exploring the the space yeah. um speaking of which we haven't really talked about the drone yet which i think is right. a major part of this game um and very different to how it was approached in the first game because i think in the first game it was a fun twist on the morph ball right it was like mm -hmm. what if a morph ball but you just threw it out and it was its own controllable creature and in that game it didn't have much combat ability it was more about like finding things so that you could move to different areas whereas in this game they really beef out the drone having its own skill tree having its ability to attack enemies but also its entire space on its own where you as a human cannot traverse only the drone can enter the breach and explore that space mm. what did you think about the drone overall and, and and did you like it as an addition to the game i i really like the drone i love all this very strange slightly different abilities um i think it makes the sort of traversal of the world really interesting i think i do like the breach like the concept of like you know it just feels very different style wise and it's, a bit, it's often you unlock a weapon inside the breach or you use the breach to access an area to get a weapon to then go, come back to the main world to then progress yeah i like that loop but i am a little bit tired of the whole i guess you first saw it in a game like link's awakening where you're kind of going between light mm. and dark world and trying to you're essentially like mapping in your mind and i know there's a bit there's an ability that will kind of show you the world outside the breach while you're in the breach but I'm personally just a little bit tired, especially in like 2D games that are often sort of Zelda likes or Metroidvanias where you're kind of, you're going between a light and a dark world or two worlds and just trying to kind of map out, right, that wall is in the way in this world, therefore I move past right. that. And maybe that's because I played like Oracle of um, Ages earlier this year, but I'm just right. a bit like, oh, I've just seen that mechanic one too many times as much as I think all the other mechanics in the game are pretty great interesting i um i thought it was cool but I, I totally get where you're coming from i i think it is nice in the way that when you're in the breach you can go you can pull up your map screen and you can see where that tile in the breach is in the overworld mm, the main yeah. overworld and so if you have a later game ability that lets you go from the breach into the overworld no matter where you are it's really cool for being like okay i can't access this place in the overworld let me find the breach let me find the equivalent of where that is in the breach and then i'm gonna push myself into the overworld and be in that space where i wouldn't have been able to access it otherwise and i think those are some of the exploration puzzles i enjoyed the most in terms of map my, my yeah, way yeah but as you mentioned earlier there were definitely at least three times i think throughout the game where i was like i don't know where the fuck to go um and and it was hard because yeah. you often you often went back to places where like oh no this is where the laser walls are so i can't get through here yet oh this is a giant grate can't have no way to get past this oh this is a barrier that is impossible to reverse and then you just you tackle each of these every time and you're like but where the fuck do i go and sometimes it's a case of those glowing green and blue dots on your map 
you shouldn't actually go in that direction. In fact, you should go on the opposite side of the map and go into the breach and find this other thing that will yeah, give me this get up, an item upgrade, and then come back and, and yeah, then come and back. It's... So it is miss. It's kind of leading you the wrong way in a sense. It's almost like you shouldn't really pay attention to those dots. More so, you should just think about okay, where haven't I explored in the map yet? And let's go to those other places, and maybe that will find me a thing that will give yeah. me access. But even there were times where. I looked at the map and sometimes it was a little unclear of like, oh no, that's a door that I could go through or a space I can go next to. It's not cut off because I thought sometimes, there was one instance where I was like, well, I can't go over there because that's cut off. And then I looked at the map closer. I was like, oh, no, wait, I can just go right there. Um, so mm. it's, it's a little messy because the map itself is like a mini version of the world. And so it will show you features like waterfalls and like areas and like platforms mm -hmm. in miniaturized, but shrunk down in a way that's almost pixelated that's a bit hard hard to pass in a in a way yeah so yeah it's not always clear and yeah the, the, those tough bits in the game where it's literally like right you need to go to the other side of the map into the breach get the item come all the way back it's it's very hard to kind of explain or justify yeah i could have worked that out <laughs> or like, you, you're yeah. basically being rewarded for proper exploration and i generally speaking i think the game is good at telling you that it is trying to encourage you to like just go explore sure we'll put this we will put this waypoint on your map and you will get there eventually but in the in the meantime in the next three four hours because it sometimes it feels like i've taken that amount of time to get to this one goddamn point um yeah. you know just explore see what you can find and then ultimately you, you will upgrade your skill tree in that process and make the game a, a bit easier yeah for sure um i i mean overall my thoughts on the game are I was I mainly played most of this when we were away up north uh, when I had the week off between your stag weekend and the wedding and uh, obviously I'm like writing my speech like at points and then like in the evening I was like all right I just need to relax and just like play something while the tv's on and everyone's like mm. just watching very it downstairs. easy to pick up and play this game actually. really like easy that. and so like i really like hours in the evening of like two or three hours in a row just sitting there just like catnip for my brain just exploring and going around the world and using the drone and it's and it's weird like um grappling hook thing which i had a little bit of issues with sometimes of it attaching and stuff like that yeah. but like it was really just an enjoyable like type it's a type of game and a type of genre that i relax into very easily but i think this one especially with its lack of focus on combat and just it feels so fresh yeah like, it, and it, unique it was, like really cool it was just a joy to play through and i i really despite the flaws with it and, I, and there definitely are some i think i do like this more than the first game overall wow. i think it's wow. it's for me its priorities are different but i think they spoke to me a bit more and and because it is less rigidly sticking to the blueprint of super metro like i think the times where i got lost and frustrated in axiom verge one were far worse in terms of my patience with them whereas in this game like i could spend an hour or two looking for something and then i'll be like all right i'm kind of done let me look up where i need to go and i'll be like ah okay i'll go over there now instead and i never really got annoyed with it in that way um, is that and to do with the world design or the upgrade system or a bit of both or i think it's yeah i think it's a little bit of everything but like some of it is just fast travel right because mm. that didn't exist in an easy way in the first game and so trying to figure out where to go sometimes would require a huge like journey across the other side of the map to figure out that oh no that wasn't where i was supposed to go and then you're like oh i have to go all the way back now but mm. with the ability to just ping over the map i think it it made it so much more fluid and, and easier so yeah yeah i'm yeah. really hot on it as well i i look forward to playing the end i think i've only got like an hour left or so you're I close yeah we'll for sure see. but um i look forward to just checking in next time see what that ending's like and yeah i think i might agree it is probably that <laughs> there are things i like the first game a lot but i just think there are other running and gunning style versions of metroidvanias i just prefer mm. often metroid games like yes. I, I think <laughs> like um samus returns might be my favorite of those games i don't know right. but obviously a lot of the others have gunning running elements and this game just isn't going for that and i just love that it is so I kind of love that the reviewers are just so across the board with this game. Like there right. is every score in the book uh, this game has got. And that is, it's rare these days that games can kind of divide to necessarily that degree. It's polarizing, right? Like, and I, I totally understand that, especially given the start of the game. But like, yeah, yeah. the more you dig into it, the, the more I played it, the more I fell in love with it. Yeah. And I think it's, and it's really I love cool. that it wasn't just, you know, we've, we've 
talked a lot about how disappointed we were with the jump between Guacamole 1 and 2. And mm. I, I love that Tom Hap has just gone in a completely different direction for Absolutely. this second game. And I think that does deserve praise and reward. So, yeah. I'm, yeah, that's, I'm a, that's a really good example. Yeah. Like, I, I think you can be safe with a sequel like this. And the fact that he wasn't, and he still divided people, but I, I would way prefer that. Even if I was on the other side of it, of like, oh, I didn't, it didn't click with me. I, right. I respect that so much more. Definitely. Um, in Definitely. terms of, of, of the Especially way when you're churning out one game every six years, right? Like, yeah. That's a big yeah. gamble he's taking. It really like... is. It really is. Um, but yeah, um, if, if, if you're someone who, like us, are you know big Metroidvania fans generally, I think you should definitely, definitely. check this out because it's, it's really, really cool. Um, great. Uh, I am going to just uh, check in with the end of The Great Ace Attorney 2 because I did finish that oh, nice. in, in, in between weeks as well. Uh, finally closed out um, those two games, even though the first one I didn't actually do a full replay to because i had played it previously i um i just did mainly the second game and it still took me a good 30 hours uh to get through it um these are long games you know if you're going to play both of them it's like at least 60 to 65 um and, and that's just how ace attorney games go but uh this might be one of the best games in the franchise it's definitely in my top three um every case is a banger the first case um has an interesting like uh, switch up the second case is like it's one of those ones that isn't directly related to the main plot, but is one of the best non-main plot related ones I've done, especially because the case that is a sequel to, so the case in the first game that involves this writer guy, uh, Soseki Natsume, and that's probably one of my least favorite cases in the entire franchise, and you go from that to the sequel to that case, and it's one of my favorite cases in the entire <laughs> franchise, so they really turned it around. It has, there's a moment in that case, there's a character called William Shamspear, who's this guy who's not, he's like, like, pretending he's like Shakespeare and like this this artist and stuff like that and it's a it's an absurd case and it's it, it has stuff to do with like gas lines and that electricity and like there is no series that can make me care about mundane stupid shit like that than Ace Attorney um and the particular deduction that happens involves a bar of soap and some tea and let me tell you is one of my favorite deduction moments in the entire series it is absurd and amazing and when i figured it out i was like holy shit this is great um it was just fantastic the third case in the game is like it feels like the final case that's how good it is and how like climactic and it builds up so many things and and threads that have been pulled at and then it ends with like one of my favorite twists in the entire franchise and then cases four and five are one giant case that is just this odyssey of like answering every question you had um bringing back like certain elements that you didn't expect to to return and i think the final ending like the final like reveal is like a little underwhelming just because it it's like well yeah okay of course that was going to be the case um but that said i think this is so much more about the journey than the destination and i think overall just a fantastic cast of characters um i really like like gina who's at the end of the first game you only really get to interact with her uh the final case of game one but she's a great character and she is like the She's this universe's twist on Inspector Lestrade because she's called Gina Lestrade. Um, and then like the way in which she turns from this kind of street beggar and she then becomes the apprentice to Tobias Gregson, who's like the um, he's like the police inspector. He's your uh, gumshoe. He's your gumshoe of this game, uh, of this series. Uh, and, and she becomes like his apprentice. So she kind of becomes uh, an inspector, quote unquote. And then she's like, ah, I am Inspector Lestrade. And it kind of comes full circle, uh, which I really like. So amazing characters, like just funny, just such great localization um and i love how these two games focus much more on the wider kind of politics of the time of the relationship between the uk and japan and what was happening then and obviously they had the, the real world references it brings in with like that author that i talked about when i mentioned the game last time but it's a game that is far more aware of the world it's set in as opposed to and it's being broadly historically accurate or i i mean yeah like th there are certain things in there that i i've looked up and, and checked in uh, of like what was happening at the time between the relationship between britain and japan was there an incident with tea and soap i don't believe so i okay. believe that is an invention right. of the game but um but it's a good one um but yeah i i really appreciate that this game has more intrigue in that sense and it does like do the whole big like mysterious reveal um by the end and and i think it nails it in a lot of different ways um there is one song in this game that i really want to play in the break but i can't because 
let me just say that it is a twist on a theme from the first game but playing it would be a spoiler because if you know the theme from the first game and i appreciate these are really long so people are still playing them at this point in time i'm sure people are still playing the first game let alone the second but it is maybe one of my favorite like taking a motif from a song and then remixing it and like telling a story through just that track alone like i get a sense of what has happened just through this one single uh theme that has been twisted and changed i'm like wow so impressive one of my favorite pieces of music probably in video games now like it is so fucking good um my track of the year by far uh it's it's incredible stuff and like the soundtrack overall for this game is a stunner one of my favorite soundtracks all i'm saying is like the first game in this series i totally understand why people were down on it because i was kind of down on it when i played it i was like okay this this was good and i really enjoyed the difference and the shake up and the the setting and herlock sholmes and all of his, his fun stuff but the cases in the first game it just feels like it's ramping up it does it never feels like it gets started it gets to the end and just as things are getting there but now i realize that really this is one massive game taken together and it should have really been released as one giant game but of course that wasn't realistic back then when they were making the series but it's kind of crazy that they put out the first game like not knowing whether they get the green light to do the second but the second is like so important to the entire story it's like lots of stuff that happens in the first game is deliberately setting up what happens in the second um and so like this the first game does need to exist for the second to be as good as it is but there really is this um for me it's it's it was tricky to having played that not be able to play it straight away and so i'm I'm glad that they finally localized it and people won't have that problem now because people can just roll straight from the first game into the second um and and not have to have that worry um the only worry is it will be 60 hours of your life which is a long time but uh honestly it was worth it i i i adore these games and i, I really like love the series and i'm so glad that we finally got a localization for this one and i'm very excited to see uh, where we go next um with a, a seventh game which is uh, coming out potentially so yeah um also wanted to say that um friend of the show devon is playing through these games and uh, at some point soon we will be doing spoiler casts on these so probably two separate ones one for the first game one for the second but yeah look forward to actually talking about the story which is uh, something i can't really go into on a show like this because it will spoil everything uh, and that's the game so yeah but uh, look out for that hopefully coming sometime soon um Valley. we have one last game to talk about um what that i game? put in here uh, <laughs> that was was a game we played a lot of uh, over the stag weekend i wanted to give a shout out to because i think it is it's one of the best like jackbox style games that exists but it's not ba- made by that company it's not made by the jackbox people um this is a game called what the dub uh Bally, do you want to tell people uh, what this game is what the dub is a game that takes um, small snippets from films, black and white films from, I'm assuming, like, I don't know, the 40s and the 50s. Yeah. Um, and then will beep out a single sentence or phrase within the clip. And then each person within the group is expected to type, type out uh, what do they think or type out what they think is said in a that they think would be funny and people will vote for as the funniest answer um and then you get points and not only that but when you type out your thing when you type out your phrase uh, you will watch the clip back with everyone and your phrase will be read out by like a robotic voice um yes which, also makes it extra hilarious because it's basically the same it's like the same robotic lady's voice as like google maps when you're like driving from point a to b it's it's like that turn left or this is the that kind of like voice yeah um which means that if you spell stuff wrong it will read out in a particularly funny way pronouncing certain people's names Hmm, and things like that that become (laughs) absolutely hilarious yeah um and yeah it was it was was funny because often the guys at the weekend would be like you know, Bally, what, 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 it's your stag weekend. What do you want to do next? And almost every time I would answer, like, let's go play some more What the Dub because yeah. I, I could not get enough of this game. I just had so much fun. And I will say that, like, there was one eve- afternoon, I think we played it, and some of the jokes were falling flat a bit. And then we basically mm-hmm. went to the pub, had like three pints, came back, played the exact same game, and the jokes were just so much more hilarious um, afterwards, which was. Which was great. I think it, it it's it's very funny, and especially in that environment where, you know, 
things happen on the weekend and jokes happen and people are t- taking the piss out of each other for over certain things and then these get replicated in the jokes in the game uh-huh. and then people will like mash ideas of jokes together and it just creates a really hilarious uh, time and I could not recommend it highly enough. It was hilarious. Yeah, I think it's a really like, it's a great twist on what those games have tried to do for such a long time which is to create that kind of drunk party game atmosphere um and i think this one just nails it in a very unique way that um yeah i remember watching giant bomb folk play this and thinking man that seems like a lot of fun and i i suggested um that it would be a good thing that we could play and uh, turned out to be a, a hit uh, everyone really enjoyed it i think so um yeah very very glad to have played some some what the dub um and you know even even in more tamer settings i have played it with work as well uh, in the past and uh it can it can even work on that level like you know a bit more pg with, with <laughs> jokes but you can still make some funny <laughs> stuff man um with that game sometimes the funniest stuff is stuff that isn't like um on on like like a bad level at all it's just yeah, like yeah. really smart observations that end up being funny as a result yeah. of that you know yeah and it, it's interesting because it almost became algorithmical in certain aspects where it was right. like right this certain joke or you say this certain bad thing or you you put the two together in some certain way and the more we played it you could just see some of the more algorithmic answers falling much much more flat and it was yes the, the more we played you could tell that the outside the box answers were getting more rewarded more and more as it went on because yeah, totally. you know, like that creative because you, ha- you haven't seen it before right like once right. the floodgates on the alley t jokes were open then yes. eventually like by round four of another alley t joke it's yeah, like okay yeah. we get it you, you know? gotta so, hit um, when the iron's hot and you gotta know right. when the iron's not hot anymore because otherwise it becomes a really flat joke Um, yeah totally but it's it's really fun just to to try all that and i would say as someone who because we also played like um what's the t-shirt game oh tko in tko yeah and i think there's other games in jackbox party pack where sometimes i'm just not feeling creative and i really struggle i for some reason i find it easier to create an answer for what the dub for some reason i don't i just Mm. find it easier and i don't know if you feel the same way but like there's yeah, I think part of it is it. also the quick fire nature. You're, there's not a lot of downtime, um, no, which you really there have can to go be. Quick. Jackbox games can certainly have more downtime. Like TKO is a great example of like it, you get really funny moments, but they are so brief compared to the amount mm. of downtime you have to and create that stuff. It's quite a lot of work stuff. to get to those moments and like right. being creative and things. And exactly. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it, it's really interesting. I think it's just it. It's a great time, and yeah, I man, that is a fun game it's good it's good stuff um cool well i think that is going to close us out for the first part of the show lots of video things to talk about uh, but we are not going to be slowing down Um, we're going to be talking about much more uh in the next part of the show so don't go anywhere we'll be answering your emails see you in a bit
Hello everyone and welcome back to the second segment of today's show. It is time for your emails. Uh, we put out a call last time, which was some time ago. Didn't get it was a while ago, considering response. how long we recorded ago. Um, it's like yeah. a month ago. Something like that. It's happened a couple of times this year. Yes. Uh, hopefully we'll be a bit more plain sailing for the yeah, rest. Uh, hopefully, but, yeah. hopefully. but please email this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. That is this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. We would really appreciate your questions, your comments. Uh, we, we read them all. So, yeah, we, that'd be most welcome. Our first email is actually a message on Discord from Jamie, who's from Edinburgh, says, Hello, with one week to go to the third anniversary of Nintendo Switch Online and the rumors of a Game Boy emulator on Switch, do you think there's an impending announcement? If the Game Boy rumors are true, what's your top five games you'd want to hit the emulator? And then he says that his are Metroid 2, Pokemon Yellow, Game & Watch, Mario Tennis, Metal Gear Solid on the Game Boy Color nice um yeah so this has been popping around the rumor sphere for a little while now people thinking there is a quote-unquote september direct imminent um i don't know how you feel about those rumors bally i, I just don't believe in any rumors these days anymore when it comes to nintendo there's so. a pretty consistent cadence for september directs i think it's like 11 out of the last 12 or 10 out of the last 11 years or something uh, there's been oh, a wow. direct of some form so sometimes it's like a smaller pokemon or fire emblem focused one but there is always something it seems so i would okay i would bank that there's something and this time i reckon it's probably a more g general direct rather than a game specific one uh, because we did have a pokemon yeah. one like last month right so i, I i'll i'll I buy it basically. There were some rumors about Monolith Soft and their website being updated and that potentially coinciding, but that time has already passed. Um, but when they were going to do that update, because the last time they updated it, I think was before they announced Xenoblade Two. So there's also the rumors come around when that um, uh, when Jenna Coleman had that weird fan interaction oh, where yeah. she supposedly said that they're making a new one, which then I think Imran Khan over at Fanbyte wrote a story saying yes, they were supposed to reveal it earlier, but they haven't yet, and they probably will reveal it before mm. the end of this year so i was really expecting honestly to see xenoblade 3 or, or something from on the soft at e3 this year so i was a little surprised they didn't show that so so i do expect that to get announced at some yeah. point pretty soon um which means that yeah it would it would coincide nicely with a, a a direct and that would be good but uh but yeah it seems like last year they didn't really do anything with the super nintendo with or with the online service because uh, they added nes then the year after they added super nintendo and then it's kind of been two years since that happened so mm. Uh, a, a Nintendo's like absolutely glacial pacing. Uh, here we are finally <laughs> with uh, with potentially Game Boy games and not even Game Boy Advance games. I mean, it's it's one of those things that people. I, I saw Chris Scullion on on Twitter being like, "Well, like, okay, this could be a terrible thing," and I totally agree that it's it's super slow and, and unreasonable and all that stuff. But what if like their next console they keep this entire system going, and so you start the next console with NES, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy, and then they just keep adding to that's it over far time. Logical, I think that's I, way I like too it. optimistic, uh, like <laughs> given the way Nintendo operate with this stuff, where every time there's a new console, it's a clean slate. We're gonna start <laughs> from the beginning. Damn. I would not be surprised if Switch 2 comes along and they're like, anyway, NES games. <laughs> you love those, right? Um, would not be shocked if that was the case. Uh, uh, it's that interesting said, that we kind of progress from Super Nintendo to Game Boy and it's rarely Super Nintendo to N64, for example. You know, like it's, yeah. it's always kind of more Game Boy. Game Boy Color. Remember before the Switch came out and everyone was like, yeah, GameCube virtual console's happening. Uh, yeah, hmm, funny mm. that. That <laughs> didn't yeah. really work out, did it? That's uh, one of like the most locked away consoles. It's arguably the sure. most locked away when you think of like, it's the oldest console that hasn't had any like substantial, you know, it's had a couple of re-releases or remakes, but it's not had yeah. any actual emulation officially from Nintendo, right? Right, exactly. Like, you, the two Zelda games, like Twilight Princess and Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess, even in that case, was a Wii game as well. Mm. Um, so, Twilight Princess, potentially, if they put that out on Switch, it will be four Nintendo consoles in a row that that has released <laughs> on, because it's GameCube, Wii, Wii U is with the HD one, and then it would be again on Switch, uh, which would be pretty wild for Twilight, Twilight Princess, just being in the, the limelight for that long. Um but yeah, I I mean, my dream is obviously to have a GameCube virtual console. I think there's so many, like, small, weirder GameCube stuff. And to be honest with you, some of the third-party GameCube stuff has just wound up on the Switch eShop anyway. Like, stuff like Tack and the Power of yeah. Juju or, like, these other weird a platforms very random from that era. Probably, but yes, yeah. yeah. 
I want to play that weird Hobbit game from back then. That's what I yeah, want to play, you know? Yeah. Um, I really want to dig deep into some The rights some on niche. the token stuff are weird because there's that, like, Gollum game that's been yes, in the yeah. making for a while now that's kind of separate to the the official films or whatever. And, yeah, uh, yeah, it's weird. It's just totally... But the Amazon uh, show is tied to the official films, I believe, right? It's not Yeah, separate. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's... I definitely would love, as everybody would, to see Nintendo actually do meaningful expansions to this online service and give us games that people in the year 2021 care about. Like, look, I, I feel like... The, it is diminishing returns when it comes to Super Nintendo and NES. Look, Super Nintendo is still fantastic, but I still think like lots of people who come to video games these days look at Super Nintendo games and have a hard time yeah, getting yeah. into them. We're, we're right? like the last um, generation, arguably, that finds them, you know, um, palpable. Like we, we yeah. can we can we can stomach some Super Nintendo games. We struggle with NES. We've said that on the show before. For sure. But um, yeah. I think you're right. A lot of people younger than us coming to video games mm-hmm. will probably look at those Super Nintendo games and think. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to wait for something else, you know? Like, I, yeah. A lot of these are, haven't aged the best, but yeah. But with Game Boy games, I think it's slightly different because we did grow up with them. So for me, I'm actually more open-minded to trying Game Boy games versus NES games. A great example of this are the Dragon Quest Game Boy games, which are remakes of the NES ones. And it's not like the Game Boy has like a massive jump visually over nes but for some reason the aesthetics of game boy the nostalgia associated with so many of those like the sound chip in it like the music Mm. all that stuff for me makes it really easy for me to play dragon quest one on game boy versus dragon quest one on nes right like it's just more palatable i just prefer it it's it's easier it's smoother it's yeah i just like it a lot more but there's not a massive jump there. will they do you think they will just do Game Boy or they'll do Game Boy and Game Boy Color at launch? I think it's both. Yeah, think I think Game Boy both. and Game Boy Color. Because to be honest with you, it's one system. Like the, the Game Boy and Game Boy Color is a weird jump because it's not a full jump in any meaningful no, way. It is strange. a lot yeah. more akin to a DSi or a 3DS, new 3DS or whatever. Like it's it's a minor thing in the grand scheme of things. Um, I had a, a driving game I've forgotten the name of now, but it was a Game Boy game. It was like yeah. that style of cartridge. But then when you put it in a Game Boy Color, um there was like a separate intro movie that was in color that only appeared Ooh, okay. in, the, in the Game Boy Color version, but it didn't appear in the standard Game Boy game. So it's, it did more than just colorize certain Game Boy games. And obviously the Game Boy Color games had a lot more color, but they could colorize yeah. the older games. But it could still add in extra elements in a really weird way. But yeah, nice. Um, I I think that uh, there is definitely Game Boy is one of those libraries that I think when people were chatting about what if they did a Game Boy Mini like they did with the other consoles, you know. And again, that's another example of Nintendo just loving Super Nintendo and NES and not giving anything else breathing room. It's like they made these two mini consoles dedicated to this, and yet even with those, still the only platforms on the Switch are are those ones. So, um. A Game Boy one, I think a lot of people had trouble thinking of, like, what are the big Nintendo games that would be on here? Um, and to be honest with you, there's not a huge amount of them. And, uh, and all the major ones, I feel like I've played most of them, right, at this point in time. We've, we've got um, pretty good coverage of the big ones, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it is interesting to dig in a little deeper to the Game Boy catalog. And I think what the Super Nintendo and NES services have taught me is I really like when Nintendo put out weird shit like Jelly Boy on the cons- on the service because... Mm like we've all played mario world and super metroid and link to the past and they're there and you can still play them if you want to um but i i'm i've played those before and i would like to try something weird and different so so my list of five game boy games are more like what would i want to actually play that is new to me on the service um uh, what about you bally uh most of these i have played before but there's a couple i haven't that i i think i would like to try i'm like cool it's time to try this game because i've heard about it i want to try it nice uh do you want to just run through your list and then we sure. can chat about it and then i'll run through mine um i think you have to have super mario land and six gold coins i think super mario land 2 that is super yeah. mario land 2 um i think that when people think of classic mario they obviously think of mario bros and everyone goes oh mario bros 3 is the best game best platform ever best top top 10 games of all time you know this kind of thing and and we've said on the show before how much we more veer towards super mario land 2 and i think that if you're showing someone who's new to video games a classic mario platformer i think super mario land 2 is the game to show them i, I think it it's is so much more so accessible good. it's just more an accessible, easier more easier game it's very yeah. weird 
Um, Super weird. Remember that I, level with I'd all the it. fucking jelly where you're just like jumping like in the jelly? What a weird... And the mini Mario... The Mario yeah, um, so machine strange. levels. I love yeah. it. I love and that game. And it's, it's weird probably this. slightly easier than those like classic Mario Bros. games, especially... I think like... it's quite a bit easier, yeah. to be honest. Like, as someone who's played Mario 3, that game kicks you in the balls repeatedly. Like, mm. that game is a yeah. fuck you on so many levels. And I know people love it, but like, more people need to just go back and play it today because that game is fucking hard and mm. it's not hard in a fun way, I found um it's i think mario world strikes a much better balance difficulty wise and especially when you have save states which make it a lot easier like the end the end levels of mario world playing them with save states felt like playing like super meat boy levels which was a more fun way of of going through that game but even with mario 3 just has elements to it that i just really dislike and 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 find hard to get on board with trap doors and shit you've talked about before yeah i don't know it's it's just a bit of a mess um that game for me personally which i know is sacrilege to everybody but uh, i just don't really like mario 3 a lot i think we're agreed we really don't think this will come because nintendo guard this franchise like with all the money they can <laughs> that's like with mm-hmm. the pokemon games so i'd, I'd yeah. love to play pokemon gold and silver i've been meaning to on 3ds and i just haven't got around to it if that came to switch i'd absolutely start a new game on pokemon silver and play that uh but yeah. you know issues to do with trading and save states and yeah we we're chatting a little bit about this before but um nintendo are so against the idea of players quote-unquote being able to exploit things right this was an issue with animal crossing and why for so long you couldn't back up your save data is because nintendo were like well what if they duplicate this item and it's like well nintendo people are making billions of fucking bells rigging the turnip market anyway (laughs) so like why do you care in this game that doesn't really have like there's no competitive animal crossing scene you know it's just it's such a it's such a mess um yeah and they do want to link everything back to Pokemon Bank. And yeah, Pokemon Bank is, is the is the thing I think that they're worried about of like, because on 3DS you could take Pokemon from those versions of Red and Blue and put them into Bank, and the idea of having save states alongside... I, to be honest with you, actually, I think... I'm, I don't know if save states are in the 3DS versions of Pokemon Red and Blue because that virtual console did have save states as well. I believe so, they do do i yeah, played red yeah. back in like 2016 ish and I, okay. i'm pretty sure it did have a safe state mm. i could be wrong i, I yeah. need to check but um maybe not because i think my worry with that is nintendo would be like well you can save state and so you can get a million fucking geo dudes and it's like well nintendo i can just catch a million fucking geo dudes it's not that hard to get you know um yeah. so yeah it's a whole thing um i would love to see gold and silver crystal probably is i think crystal is probably the best version of those games even though it's not the one that i played the most of um mm. but yeah I, I think it would be good to put that on there yeah um a great game they uh could do that wouldn't be linked at all to like you know any of the pokemon bank stuff would be the pokemon trading card game which i yes. think is just a fantastic game and maybe runs into some issues where they want to be promoting their current trading pokemon trading card game and this is very yeah. much the gen 1 1999 2000 card game uh but that game is just so awesome and another they, game they I'm should really just make a new to. fucking pokemon trading they card game they need to do that they do need to do that yeah. um fourth I've never tried Harvest Moon on Game Boy. I'd love to play okay. some Harvest Moon on Game Boy. Um, and in line with that, a, an RPG, sort of semi-RPG, I've heard a lot of good things about that um, actually inspires a game like Moongalo Bay, actually, that's coming mm-hmm. out hopefully later this year, is a game yeah. like Legend of the River King, which I've heard I, a lot about. Yeah, I, I had this on my list as it's well. On the list. Um, I'd love to play that game. Just, it's... A, it's it's still a very popular Game Boy game to my knowledge. It's not like c- crazy unusual, but it's no. not one that's talked about in the same breath as Pokemon and Mario. So, like, I would love to try that game because um, yeah, it's like a fishing RPG basically. Right. And so, like, you have this idea of it, like something about the style of like overworlds and characters in Game Boy games. Um, there's a game called Survival Kids as well, which I didn't put on my list, but I think is also like a Zelda style top down um, RPG. Like something about those towns and the like, coziness of, of the, the look. I think mm. this style of game fits Game Boy really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and just playing games like Dodgeball Academia and like uh, Golf Story. Um, I, I just loved it. Like RPGs don't have to be, battles and fantasy settings and things like we can yeah. do rpgs with other things and like i would also advocate stuff like mario golf mario tennis on game Boy color coming back because they are just such great rpg modes to those games that i'd love to play again but yeah those would be yeah. my five 
Nice, yeah, some good picks there for sure. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd put Legend of the River King on mine too. I think I just, I would like to dig into stuff like that, like Survival Kids as well, that is just not really talked about by anybody, but was drop and I, I think conversation would happen about it. And I don't know how, like how good those games are really, like in the grand scheme of things, but as someone who grew up on you know a weird game like quest for camelot on game boy that was like a zelda ripoff that that had like the similar vibes to i think what these games have i think i would really click with it and i'm, I'm excited and i think yeah as you mentioned moon Glo- moon glow bay which is coming out is kind of trying to be the modern equivalent of it where it's mm. taking an rpg and, and doing fishing stuff with it and uh yeah fishing's great like uh, fishing is weirdly one of those things that is in so many games um and has just become like a staple of video yeah. games somehow yeah. um and I, I don't know really know why but it just is yeah i've done it in lots of games but i never i've never played an exclusively fishing game and i think i do yes. owe it to myself to definitely try a couple for sure yeah i think it would be real fun um i've got a few options here so i'm gonna go with one that i definitely want to check out just from a technological standpoint i want to play x uh by argonaut software this was the game uh by dylan cuthbert and his team at argonaut the the people who made Star Fox, the original Star Fox, um and obviously went on to become q games and, and do all, all that stuff uh, but they were wizards, man, in terms of technology. And X is basically a flight sim game in first person that creates pseudo 3D on Game Boy. Um, and I think just I, as someone who played the original Star Fox and actually preferred it to 64 and found so much to like in what that game did, just because of the technical limitations of what the Super Nintendo and Super FX chip could do at the time, I'm just fascinated by this idea of the same idea but done on a Game Boy, which is like even less powerful hardware. Like, how do you manipulate a system to to make something that is a space shooter um, that you can see in 3D on on a screen that's that small and and shrunk down in that way? So obviously, um, yeah, that's 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 more of a curiosity thing. But I would I'd love to see that game on the system, a piece of Nintendo history that is very rarely talked about. Um, I would also like to see donkey kong 94 on there now donkey kong 94 is a game that everyone talks about as one of the best game boy games it is kind of the precursor to the um the the mario games that were made by nst that are like the march of the minis and stuff like that and obviously mario versus donkey kong on gba Mm. um, is that an original game it's not a port of an nes game Donkey Kong 94 is yeah. a an original game. Yeah, it right. was not put on anything else. because So the, the way it starts out is you just play regular Donkey Kong, right? right? So you're playing arcade Donkey Kong on a Game Boy. But what happens is once you finish that, then it opens the game up and it's like, oh, this is totally different. And it becomes... Now, this is the thing. I really despise Mario vs. Donkey <laughs> Kong. It's probably my most hated GBA game. I absolutely despise playing through it and, and thought it was just I terrible. Really actually, I actually really liked it. It was garbage. It's a garbage game for garbage people. Um, and Donkey Kong 94 is like the precursor to mm. that. So you would think that I would probably hate it, but I, I feel like I could be redeemed here. I feel like I want to try it for myself and see if if it is better than the sequel and if it is really uh, deserving all, all the love it gets. Because it, it was that idea of those style of levels where you're collecting the key and, and trying to get it to places and, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. go across levels and doing the weird backflip Puzzle and stuff platform. like that. Puzzle platformer, yeah, it's, it's definitely like a unique, interesting game. So, I would love to try that. Um, next, uh, I would really want to play Mega Man Five on Game Boy. Now, this is an interesting one because they remade a bunch of the Mega Man games on Game Boy, but Mega Man Five is more of a unique one. It's actually more of its own game. It has different stuff in it, uh, extra bosses and, and different content, and as someone who played Mega Man 5 relatively recently the super uh, sorry the NES game that is my second favorite behind Mega Man 2 um and so the idea that the Mega Man 5 on Game Boy is itself a very unique and different uh style of game I I really want to check that out and you know I think a lot of people can say you know you don't need to play the Game Boy versions of any of these other ones but if you're going to play one of them play Mega Man 5 on Game Boy so that's one that I do want to check out and and see how that works because Mega Man is a series that I think is pretty easily mappable to Game Boy. Obviously, the screen size makes it harder for some of the platforming, but um, generally, I think it probably works pretty well. Um, and and then, yeah, I've got a couple of others, so this is maybe cheating in doing six, not five, but 
Uh, I do want to play Mole Mania, which is the Miyamoto game um, that did get a release on uh, 3DS Virtual Console, but I've not had the chance to check out yet. I'm sure it's one of those that's like, hey, this is kind of niche, but some people have heard of it, but it will probably be put on the service. I imagine that Mole Mania will definitely get some play. And um, and yeah, it's, it's just a different, unique type of game that I've not really seen out of Nintendo before and, and would like to check out and, and see what's going on with it. Because, um, you know, Miyamoto's name gets attached to a lot of different things, but I think this is one that he was really quite heavily involved with back in the day um, and, and you don't hear that a lot about Game Boy projects so um, I would like to check that out uh, and then Gargoyles Quest is another um, I really need to finish Demon's Crest on Super Nintendo uh, because I have started that on the app as well um, and that game is really unique and weird and is a kind of side-scrolling action game that also has super effects stuff where you go over to the map and you're this demon who's like flying over it as if it's like a, a ship in Final Fantasy VI or something like going over the overworld. It has that kind of tilt look to it so you can go to different levels uh, however you want and non-linearly uh, uh, explore the space. Almost Metroid style in some way but but much more of a kind of straight ahead action game. Um, and Gargoyle's Quest is a game that is I believe in the same lineage uh, as Demon's Crest and uh, Similar character, um, similar world, and uh, I, uh, I want to check that out as well. So, so those are some of mine. Um, if we're talking about something that's a classic that needs to be put on Switch service, put fucking Pokemon Pinball on there. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. That'd be great. Because you can get the Rumble. Switch yeah. has Rumble inbuilt. Don't need I'm to sure have a... take a whole lot of extra programming they can't be yeah. hooked with, but <laughs> yeah. I would love that. I don't think so. I think they could do it. And, yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, that's one of the special things about that cartridge. It's just an oversized fucking cartridge. Yes. Um, especially if you stick that into, like, a Game Boy Micro. I don't know. Did Game Boy Micros play original Game Boy games? Or are they taking that out? That I point, believe but... they do not. I could okay. do that. I yeah, I mean, because that would be fucking crazy. A yes. Game Boy, because the the cartridge for fucking Pokemon Pinball is bigger than a Game Boy Micro. I think. I mean, I played way more of uh, Ruby Sapphire Pinball, which I think yeah. is actually a better game. But they are both yeah. very good. They are They're both, both very excellent. Good. Yeah. So yeah. so yeah, we'll see what so, yeah. we'll see if this launches. And you know, I'm I'm feeling like there will be a direct in September, and I feel like this will be an announcement. So I'm sure they'll launch with I don't know, ten or so, ten fifteen games or so. So I we'll hope see. so. We'll yeah, see what's in there. So. I'm looking, give cuts. me some weird shit, Nintendo. Give me weird shit. That's what I want. I'm confident they'll do a combination of a, a five bangers and five deep cuts, you know? like a yeah, bit like I, I'm Super pretty confident Link's Awakening will be on there, yes. as will the Oracle games and some of the Wario Land games and obviously yeah. Mario Me Land. Metroid like, 2 or something. Metroid 2, right, yeah. which no one should play Metroid 2. Just don't play that <laughs> game. It's bad. Just play the remake, please. It's one of um, Jamie's picks, Metroid 2. Come on. I know. I have tried to play Metroid 2. It is just a terrible video <laughs> game. No one should play it. It's awful. Just start with um, Super Metroid. Start ju Super no, just just play the remake for God's sake. The remake is so so good. And the, uh, yes, the remake that. is fantastic. fantastic. Yes, yeah, for sure. Thanks for your question, Jamie. We shall see about Game Boy games on Virtual Console. Well, Switch Online, whatever it's called. Our next email is from Dave97. It's actually on Discord as well. It says, Hey, Mizet and Bally, as we approach the fall season, how would you predict and rank the following Switch first and second party games in terms of sales potential? Mm. So we've got WarriorWare Get It Together, Metroid Dread, Mario Party Superstars, Pokemon BDSP, and Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. Uh, number one being the most successful to number five being the least successful. Thanks for always providing a great podcast. Sales oh potential. This is fun. Um, this is tough. This is tough. It's tricky, yeah. Um, it definitely games that vary in terms of expectation and, and sales and stuff like that. We're going to uh, make a joint these, list. I think so, yeah. Let's I think we it. can agree on, on how, how these are going to go. Yeah. Um, my feeling, uh, and this is just based on current sales data of games that are out there on Switch, is as much as we hate it, Bally, the best-selling game will be Mario Party of these five. Um, I think it's close between that and Pokemon, but I think it's those two. Yeah, you're right, actually. Pokemon, yeah, Pokemon and Mario Party are definitely the top two, um, which I, does better. I can't call it between those two, honestly. How, what are you feeling? It's it's tricky. I, I do think that Pokemon has maybe a more fervent fan base that will go out day one and just get it, versus Mario Party maybe has a longer tail you know like because families who get to the switch late will be like oh a new mario party this is the one that said this mario party is doing a lot of nostalgia baiting with classic n64 boards and older mini games so it's a really tight call i would say that probably pokemon just edges it 
because Pokemon just as a brand is bigger and you know Sword and Shield has sold more than the current Mario Party that's on Switch um but also you do have nostalgia from people who play Diamond and Pearl and um you know th- everyday people are going to pick up Pokemon you know Ali T who we uh you know we talked to recently and he was mm-hmm. like I'm going to the games he's going to buy on Switch are going to be the Pokemon games and that includes Diamond and Pearl and that is a lot of people um so my thought is Diamond and Pearl probably number 1 Mm -hmm. And then Mario Party number two behind that, which pains me. And maybe it's a conversation, man. But Metroid Dread feels like it's got momentum. It feels like it's it's building, pushing that game hard. Like, like, it is the most Nintendo have given a shit about Metroid in near a decade. Like, uh, it's surprising to me. It's like here's a new trailer. Here's another new trailer. Do you know Metroid Dread's coming out? It's here's a new trailer. um, Here's the here's the final boss, guys. Let's just spoil the fucking whole game. I have avoided all the trailers like since its reveal. I've basically not looked at anything. And you advise me. It's a smart move. Smart move. Yeah, that second trailer fucking amazing uh i'm so excited because of that second trailer but it did spoil a bunch of stuff which i'm not too bothered about i'm far less spoiler sensitive than you are as, as we all know hmm. um but uh but yeah I, I i told you i was like bally this trailer is sick don't watch it you will be annoyed if you watch this trailer so um yeah nintendo are really just uh they're going out there I, with that game i would go metroid 3 you do think metroid at i 3. think the and- amount they're pushing it and i think there's enough switch owners out there who claim to be interested in metroid that i think yeah you know i think it's got a very good shot are we being too optimistic um because warrior where is i, w- I don't know warrior where's a brand that i, I think is popular i think it's mixed um i think it's it probably is kind of it, i think warrior and metro are probably at a similar place um maybe warrior where in the past like the launch game on ds probably did incredibly well um mm-hmm. uh, and stuff like that but i don't i don't know as a series how it is done generally yeah the thing with the amount they're pushing metroid dread um and could it could do you think it could be number two because i have a feeling that there's potential there but this also depends on like are we talking sales lifetime or are we talking sales by the end of the year because um because those yeah, are two different conversations yeah. um i was thinking I, lifetime. I think lifetime probably mario party eclipses it um yeah which is i sad. i can't put metroid 2 I can't. I can't yeah, do it. Yeah. I no, think, I think you're right. Yeah. Much as we hate it, much as we don't want Mario Party, which is just basically a remake of N64 <laughs> games, and I'm sure it'll be fun, and it has online multiplayer, which is great, and maybe that will make me get it yeah. at some point. There, there, there's a reason we are seeing this hashed together N64 strange four stat Mario Party, and that's because the last one sold unbelievably well, and Nintendo uh-huh. think they're onto a winner here. So, yeah, yeah, I think. I go that yeah Pokemon one Mario Party two Metroid Dread three it pains me Advance Wars is last Advance Wars, Advance is, last, Wars okay? is so last it is the most last possible it's very it is last absolutely last by far reboot camp hopefully will sell decently it's, this is stiff competition I think reboot camp can still do very well and still be last in this list like I I'm confident it can at least get the you know the one two million hope hopefully. Hopefully. I think that's a good result. I think it depends on how Nintendo treat it, right? Like, if they give it the Metroid Dread treatment and they're cheerleading it and they're like, look, guys, this series was dead. It's back, baby. We're pushing Advance Wars. If you never tried it, now is your chance to check it out. Way Forward are making it. If you buy this one, maybe we'll let Way Forward make an original Advance Wars. Who knows, you know? Mm. Um, I think it definitely hinges on on that Um but WarioWare is... So here's the interesting thing with WarioWare. I wonder to what degree the price of WarioWare versus the perceived value of WarioWare hurts it sales-wise. Because mm. it is cheaper. Um, I got my copy for like 33 quid or, or whatever. So it's way cheaper. I wonder if Reboot Camp might also be slightly cheaper. Like, I wonder if it's not full price. Yeah, I, I haven't know. checked. I think the eShop probably will have that stuff. Um, so maybe that is a cheaper game as well. But I, my feeling is it isn't. My feeling is it's $60, um, mm. which means it's like 50 quid on our eShop. And that is, oh, that shakes me inside. But um, which also has a hindrance on it, right? Like if it, it if it is outpriced, uh, and WarioWare is also, I think WarioWare ends up, you know, taking the day there, um, yeah. because it's yeah. it's more recognizable to people. Um, they just did a whole thing on Twitter yesterday where Wario took over the Twitter account. You know, like Nintendo memeing with Wario uh, probably helps sales for that game. It is, it's definitely 
it's a Twitter game as well. When you think about like the ways in which Twitter has helped Nintendo games over the past uh, decade or so, and and building excitement, like Animal Crossing, of course, is a great example of it. I think Fire Emblem, the memes of Fire Emblem, was definitely a big deal for that game. Mm. I think WarioWare's just weirdness um, of natural meme ability helps it uh, yeah. in that space as well. I, the um, people here party games and warrior wear and they immediately think oh it's like mario party and it's like yeah i think there's so many people who just have not tried warrior wear at all and don't really know what it is and i, I think mean it's pretty hard to describe to be honest it's very hard <laughs> to describe totally um but yeah it's uh, it's a very strange it's incredibly japanese and it, yeah it's not had it's not being sort of made more Western in any way whatsoever. It's very pure to what it's, it's trying to do. It's a game where you have like deliberately terribly drawn characters in the background <laughs> yes. of micro games. And it's like, that's not because the artists are bad. It's like their intention was to make this garbage looking guy <laughs> sitting behind a desk, right? Because that's the aesthetic of WarioWare. And, yeah. and you see that they're actually talented artists and, and uh, 3D modelers because the kind of lobby sit, uh, section before you enter a micro game has like, all this color and animation mm. and everything like going and then you just get into this ms paint thing and it's like <laughs> okay like oh, I, I guess that's the decision but that is what yeah. warrior wear is and it's been it's been dining out on that same style for like what seven eight games now and, exactly like, it, it is still yeah. a strong unique it's just thing. hilarious you know yeah. like it just yeah. works so um, yeah i i think it's gonna be um fourth on this list but yeah so this list is at number one, Pokemon. Yes. Number two, Mario Party. Number three, Metroid. Number four, WarioWare. And sadly, number five, Advance Wars. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a... Ch if there was one thing I would swap uh, and might be wrong, I think you could potentially swap Metroid and Wario would be my... If we were going to Interesting. I, I, I want to leave it the way it is, but if, I, if there was one area we're wrong, um, and as you say, end of life sales end of life i think end, end of, of life this is pretty solid yeah. my dream is the end of year metroid will have outsold mario party and we would have killed that <laughs> fucking mario party if that happens like we're gonna be in for a decade of metroid games which i hope so very good I fucking um, hope so. but who knows advance wars might you know come up come up the rear if you who knows it's number yeah. one slot <laughs> for, for this year definitely not because it's coming out in december so it just has less time oh, to sell like, well, right yeah, um, totally, which is totally. tricky yeah, um yeah. but but yeah i think lifetime wise there could be a place where advanced wars eclipse is warrior where i don't know i just I, I just warrior where it for me is a bit of the wild card in this because yes, it's i don't know it's play. relative popularity because it's been away for a while but it did have a 3ds game that was a compilation but yeah it's a bit of a mess um so so yeah was it not a 2019 3ds game something like that yeah, yeah warrior where gold came out real late um and uh at the very least, I know that WarioWare is more popular than Rhythm Heaven, which pains me because I think Rhythm Heaven is yeah. better than WarioWare. Yeah, do some um, rhythm, rhythm Heaven for sure. But yeah. For sure. That would be... Oh, that's that's a game I want on Switch real bad. Real, real bad. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, great question, Dave97. That is that is a good one. I do enjoy predicting <laughs> predicting sad. And we will check it back in with this question, let's say. Should we say in like a year's time? We'll just like have a little check in. Sure, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that the Nintendo sales data when it next comes out will give us a good idea. Yes, uh, yeah. At, at least Definitely somehow of, of where see, things shake out. See how we've done. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's all we've got time for emails on this segment. But if you would like to send an email to the show, please email this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com uh, we would greatly appreciate your comments and your questions uh but yeah. that's all we've got time for in this segment join us after the break where we're going to be talking about the, the cost of video games uh we will be right back <laughs>
All right, everyone, welcome back to the third and final part of today's show. Uh, it's time to talk about how much video games cost and how much we spend our money on them. Um, it's an interesting topic, I think, brought about by the idea that uh, potentially the Switch is getting a price drop. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I haven't actually uh, had too much of a look into this, Bally, but uh, I guess the gist of it is that potentially in Europe they are dropping the price of the Switch by 50 euros. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, so currently the Switch sells for about 330 euros, and in the US it's about $300, and then in the UK it's £279. Pounds. Whereas this means that like it will be reduced to 270 euros. So like it's a substantial decrease. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we don't tend to see Nintendo drop price on hardware. It's very rare to see them do that. They never mm. did it for the Wii U. The Wii U remained the price it was for as long as it was. Um, and uh, it was 3DS that was the biggest one, which yeah. was like six months after launch. They were like, right. oh, yeah. no Crazy. one's buying Crazy. this. Let's it all, just... It all depends on the success, right? I, I should yes. also say that like a 60 euro drop would equate to about a $70 or an 80 pound drop in yeah. the UK. So it would potentially be 229 US dollars or 200 pounds in the UK. So like if that does like happen that would be pretty substantial like pre pre pretty cheap generally yeah and i wonder if um pricing in europe uh, has been a factor in how well the switch has done over there i just don't know the the specific sales for uh, mainland europe versus the uk versus japan and i know japan obviously is killing it you know the i th i believe that europe is only like one million ahead of japan like the whole of europe is like 21 million versus japan which is at 20 million switches wow. that tells you like the density of like people who play games uh, on handheld devices in japan it's it's just a massive massive market um so yeah I, I i thought we'd just like spin this into a wider discussion about how much video game stuff costs as a hobby and how much we spend on it and how we make our decisions um about what to buy when and uh, and all that kind of thing and, and i think it's it is different for us in a way because we are doing a podcast where we're talking about video games all the time and so we want to always mm. be playing something new um so that we can bring it to a show and talk about it but also just on a personal level i was kind of doing this before we started probably to a lesser degree but i was still like buying a bunch of stuff and and you know playing a bunch of stuff so bali how do you kind of justify the amount of money you spend on video games and, and what what kind of brings you to decisions about what you will buy when and, and that yeah, type of thing yeah it like as a hobby for me it is a very big part of my life like between the podcast and us playing lots and talking about them um mm -hmm. it is a big deal uh and it's obviously important to say that money like 70 pounds for a video game day one for like a sony first part exclusive like 70 pounds is a very relative number based on anyone's financial circumstances so for some of people course, it's yeah. like oh, it's dropping the ocean for other people it's like that is a ton of money and like you yeah. know for me it's a, it's it's an expensive amount of money but it's something i feel that is generally if i'm very keen on the game worth doing and should also factor mm -hmm. in the fact that you know we are supported by our wonderful patrons and <laughs> yes you know I mentally in my head will often cover a lot of the cost of games in my head by a lot of the money that we earn through Patreon, which um, always mm -hmm. helps out. So like for me, I I feel like I earn fairly well with like my, my, my job and that works well and Caroline earns pretty well as well. So like financially, I do feel like I can spend quite a lot on games. So mm -hmm. as like a rough amount, I even did like a rough calculation. Like, so the last yeah. few years have been unusual because I've seemed to have bought like multiple consoles every single year. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Three years. But let's assume a year where you don't buy a console. I worked out like ninety six pounds roughly for Game Pass for a year. Uh, also, I'll buy like two or three Sony first party, which are now like seventy pounds day one. So that's like another two hundred pounds roughly. And then so I'm already on three hundred pounds. Then you can turn like four or five nintendo games at 50 pounds each let's add on another 250 and then like a bunch of like indies that range between anything between 10 and 30 pounds i'll buy loads of those in a year so i I've, I've equated that figure to come to roughly between 600 and 700 pounds which is actually mm -hmm. for me personally that's a decent amount of money for that of joy i get from video games in a single year like that feels like a decent amount of that's that's like that's like 
if I equated that, if to you like break a, it down on a month by month basis, it's less than a hundred a month. Yeah, and less than a hundred a month. Of which, like, a lot of that is covered by some Patreon money sort of thing. So, like, it feels like a good deal. And that's obviously, you can compare this to, like, loads of other hobbies and things. But for me personally, that that's seems like a good good deal. And I get great satisfaction out of playing those games, talking about them on the show. And it's a good turnaround. Sometimes I will buy a game for a lot of money and it's not very good. And I, I'm a bit annoyed. But, hey, I can still talk about it on the show. Like exactly. Mario like Mario Golf, for example. It's right. Like, that totally. was quite a lot of money. I don't think I had a ton of fun with that game, but you know, it was good to talk about it, and that's just part of the rough with the smooth. I think of, of kind of what what we do, but yeah, that's kind of my ethos. Yeah, I'm I'm similar in that way. In in that I think a lot of what drives me is just my own curiosity about playing certain things, and I think that's definitely been accelerated by the fact that we talk about games all the time, and um, and it's it's what the core of this show really is, um, and. I think certain games like Pokemon Snap or Mario Golf, ordinarily, if I wasn't doing this show, I wouldn't buy those on my own. You know, I wouldn't go on my way to be like, yeah, I should play this to have a take on it, to to discuss it in the wider context of Nintendo and all that stuff. I would just be like, I'm just going to save my money and buy yeah. something else instead or just, just not spend money on anything because I am a habitual hoarder uh, and don't want to spend money on anything ever. Um, and uh, it's probably a, a bad thing. But, um, but I think doing that has allowed us to have better conversations yeah. about i think Nintendo some of the best conversations and... we have is when a brand new game comes out that we have both bought and both played i think that's some of the most valuable and that's not just for our podcast but for podcasts generally about video games when people are playing the things that come out and they have a good understanding of the game because they've played a good chunk of it and they can talk about that with their co-host i think it's a very valuable thing we can hopefully offer totally i do think it can become dangerous in the sense of i don't want this to necessarily become a show where we're only talking about new stuff no. all the time because i no. think such a cool part and of i think is... lots of podcasts are guilty of playing the first two hours and having a take but haven't beat the game and that part of the reason yeah. they're not beating the game is that they've already moved on to the next thing and they just continue yeah. this cycle for the whole year playing like 40 games uh-huh. in the first two hours and <laughs> yeah i don't want to be that either you're right like you yeah we generally beat any game that we like we generally beat like it's rare for us not rare for me especially not to beat a game unless i like really don't like it or i just run out of time or you know like that doesn't happen a ton so like i do very much appreciate just kind of i like this game i'm gonna buy this game Mm -hmm. i'm gonna play this game uh mbz has done the same he's beaten it we've both beaten it let's talk about it on the show like it's a a lot more valuable than we always have to be dipping like saying our two cents on every single thing that comes out and we definitely have gaps but it's better than yeah you know skirting over everything totally and look i have a backlog that is absurdly large just like i will never play every video game i own it's a fact i just have to come to terms with it i'm just not going to and to be honest with you there's a lot of stuff on steam i've got from bundles and things over the years that i was never intending to play anyway um so so that's fine like I, i'm just <laughs> I don't have any sweat off my back for that but um i think that in terms of how i value games i think this is the interesting question right of um when things got pushed up to seventy dollars for for PlayStation games, and you got Game Pass, which is this whole other thing of value, and like how games are perceived, and whether you just wait for a game to be on Game Pass just becomes an idea sometimes of an indie game is like, well, I kind of want to play this, but this seems like it'll be on Game Pass later in the year. There's just so many different ways to pay for video games these days, let alone how big free to play has has become right like stuff like apex legends and um and now split gate that has just become mm. a phenomenon recently it's, al- right? it's almost become the norm for the big multiplayer games almost yeah exactly um and so like those are games that you can literally put your entire life into and spend nothing at all um and that's crazy right because we didn't have that when we were younger um unless you go on online and find some free mmo like oh, runescape yeah. which yeah. of course i did a bunch of back when i was younger yeah. um and yeah there was loads of weird random online games that i played um and it's really hard for me when i think about okay well i'm spending 
this much on warrior wear 33 quid i'm like for me i'm like i look at that and i'm like yeah that's a pretty good deal i think that'll be all right and then i look at something like hollow knight and it's like i spent like 12 or Saji, i spent like 12 quid on it yeah and i will spend exponentially more time with those games versus something like warrior wear yeah and so it's, it's this weird thing of our perception of value and how we assign value based on like well warrior wears a nintendo first party game therefore it should be this baseline of price and i'm okay with that because my brain has tricked myself into thinking that's fine um and it's uh, thinking about other hobbies and like how much you spend on other things i'm big into books these days and, and reading a bunch of stuff and i will often go on kindle and be like oh i need to search this book to see if it's gone on sale for 99p on kindle and like this is the thing i will get so much joy out of for so long and i'm like well but i've got to get it for 99p because they go on sale for 99p all the time and then i get to a book like rhythm of war last year where it is this behemoth like 1300 pages long it is going to be like it is my favorite book i've ever read like it is that it, it like brought me to tears that book like legitimately like emotionally like such a important like piece of art that i love and yet when i bought that book i looked at it i'm like man 12.99 for a book and that's fucking absurd like why do we do that it is so so stupid um and it's it's just like the way you frame things right and and the way that yeah. um, we assign value to stuff and and it happens with people all the time where they look at games and like well you know it's this much money but um but then it comes down to the experience right like if yeah. i got the amount of joy that i get out of a game like warrior wear uh, which is a ton and i'm really really having a great time with it it's fine you know for me but then that also comes down to how much you're willing to spend on a hobby how much money totally. matters to you it's it's to everyone it is different right yeah. so like some like some people go on like a ton of foreign holidays and like i can think a few things that are more expensive than foreign holidays but like yeah some people do a ton of them you know they cost a hell of a lot of money but you know yeah. the few that i've been on i've been on a lot to be fair but yeah. they are actually really really good and there are so many benefits to those experiences and seeing different parts of the world and all these things but you know it's still really expensive and it's like it's a well, that that value decision is huge where another hobby i'm very into is watching a lot of sport now here's a top mm -hmm. tip for anyone who's into watching a lot of sport you need a parent or family member who's also really into watching sport because then they pay for like bt subscriptions and sky <laughs> subscri subscriptions yeah. and my dad gives me the codes on like both of those subscriptions and i can watch them now i pay for my own sports subscriptions as well because i watch even more than him i went especially when it comes to rugby union um and that cost me like maybe 12 13 pounds a month but hey i will watch like three edinburgh rugby games a month on that that's like three four quid a game and that feels like a i get a lot of joy from watching that game yeah, bargain it's a that. bargain like as, as a hobby that's a bargain it's still quite time intensive but as like a price it's quite cheap now if i was a season ticket holder and i spent my i think it's like 1500 pounds or 900 pounds for like a season ticket uh, at edinburgh that's now that's a different question but that's again it's just how you choose to spend your time mm. and i think that by and large everyone will have their thing they spend their money on even if it is going out for dinner and drinks with friends every single weekend like that is still um <coughs> my sister <coughs> your sister <laughs> like it's still and I, I i think your sister's very like there's lots of people you do that you know like, I, yes. i've done it obviously a ton less in lockdown but something i did a lot more say when i lived in brussels than now but so yeah it swings and roundabouts with everything but i think on average video games are a slightly expensive hobby but i yes. do think there are far more expensive hobbies and that when people who aren't into video games really break it down as to what do they actually spend their money on i don't think it's actually that too bad in the grand scheme of things and also we're talking about the hobby in a very specific way which yes, is 100 buying day one games being on top of the new releases which i think a very small amount of the wider video game um we're, we're wider video game obsessive fan base you might call it like the hardcore uh like i i even in that that minutiae in that small sub segment i think we are a sub segment of the sub segment arguably yes. you know and it's it's always important to remember that exactly you know like big games come out like witcher 3 like how many people who have played witcher 3 were people who paid for it day one and, and did it straight away versus the number of people who picked it up for like five quid on steam yeah, recently yeah. you know um and and that like as a value proposition for people i think is enormous because people play video games i think a lot of people will play 
three to four games a year, right? Like that's an ideal for most people in terms of how much time they sink into it and whether they buy it straight away or whether they buy it, you know, for a cheaper price. That is majority of, of folks who are playing games are doing it that way. And as a value proposition from that perspective, video games can be like some of the largest ever of any kind of hobby because there are games that are essentially endless right you've got mmos you've got um stuff like destiny which is a games as service uh stuff like assassin's creed odyssey which is hundreds of hours of stuff um and you could just get that on sale for like 10 quid you know Mm -hmm. Um, and that sorts you out for three months uh, you know with without having to buy anything else um so there are certainly ways in which the hobby can be a really uh, thrifty thing for thrifty people. I, right? I could uh, probably uh, cut the price of games that I play by a third to almost half off if I literally played the exact same games I play on a year delay, like that that day yes. one price versus the year delay. And I think, say we didn't do the podcast and I wasn't as I mean I'd probably still want to buy the day one games to be honest. But let's say a world where I didn't want to, yeah. and I played everything a day a, a year later. Which still... also helps in terms of quality sometimes when things get patched and things get added well, and it's just a better definitely, experience. Definitely, definitely. And I would save so much money. And I, generally speaking, compared to 90% of the people who play video games, I'd still be more current than most of them, you know, because I'd yeah, still be playing exactly. all of the previous year's releases, but for a fraction of the price. Yeah, um, it is wild when you think about it. And um, we are in a, a weird, unique position doing a show like this where we... We would want to do that. But I, I do think if I wasn't doing this, I still think I would be buying a lot of Nintendo stuff day one regardless. Definitely, yeah. I'd be the same for Nintendo and Sony first party generally. I'd buy them day one still probably. Yeah, I think for me Sony's slightly different because looking at a game like God of War that came out, um, not like nine months into that game's life cycle, it's already down to 20 quid. Uh, and that's the difference is that sony will reduce the price on their big games whereas nintendo just fucking won't so there's there's really no point to waiting for nintendo that's why i think a lot of people buy Mm. nintendo games day one is you know it's not going to go down same with xbox and game pass actually it makes no there's no point in waiting because you're just going to play on game pass later anyway same price yeah totally and the thing with xbox is all their first party stuff is day one on on game pass anyway very good for um, podcasters very good excellent yeah and and (laughs) and that's another thing right that we don't we talk about a bunch we don't necessarily address directly is look there are a bunch of games that come out on switch but they're also on game pass day one and so for us who are spending a bunch of money on games anyway it's just like financially doesn't make sense for me to spend 20 quid on dodgeball academia when like I could just play on Game Pass. And that kind of sucks in terms yeah. of... One of my best games last year, Spirit Fair, day one Game Pass. I played it. Yeah. Like, you know, like yeah. it's... And that's, that's tough in order to like speak to like, well, what's the Switch experience like? But if I'm brutally honest, Switch is kind of just like another console and there are rare exceptions to like, you know, there are certain games that obviously don't run very well on the system and that's bad and, and it's hard to recommend that sort of stuff. But stuff that's 2D like Spirit Fair, for example, like... It, it, if you are playing that docked or you're playing that on an xbox the only real difference is the controller you're using otherwise it's the exact same experience right mm. um and so I, I find it tricky sometimes with like well we've played this not on nintendo but it's on nintendo but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put that money out there when i i'm paid for the subscription anyway that i get it on um so yeah it, I, I think and i hear i hear that a lot from lots like uh people on rfn now i think guillaume who's got an xbox now has, has been doing that a bunch for for games and always has that disclaimer of well i didn't play it on switch but it, it's probably the same experience and um well he also goes to a library that seems to yes rent out that has like the nichest still. switch games possible <laughs> which is wild i wish i had that library it's that would like, be incredible well um, library doesn't do that yeah yeah so um so yeah it's uh it's definitely a thing that we juggle a bunch and and stuff like that what what is it for a game bally that that when you look at it you're like i need to buy this what 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 uh factors Uh, go into a decision of this is a game that i want to have and play right now i think something we've not really mentioned yet is the kind of the media hype train and the Mm, amount of podcasts that we listen to zeitgeist the zeitgeist and I probably have never felt the zeitgeist as high as Last of Us Part 2, to be honest. I think because the spoiler cast come out day one when, when the embargo goes, the spoiler cast is just sitting there waiting. And here I am with this 30-hour game with a week off and I'm playing it and then I'm talking with to you about it and like yeah. the whole of the internet 
to be fair, people were very spoiler conscious with that game, which is nice. And you had to go to the right areas to see people talking about it. But then beating that game, listening to all those spoiler casts, recording our own spoiler cast, like just listening to everyone's takes on like such a controversial story. And like that is peak zeitgeist, peak. I am so glad I played it at the time I did kind of reaction to that game. And right. So story can definitely have an impact, but also a game like Breath of the Wild that felt very important to at least have experienced most of that game very early on. Like I think it yeah. was games that have this huge industry impact that you f it feels like the whole world is playing when really it's just a very vocal niche on on the internet on the internet. Mm -hmm. But when you get that feeling and all the podcasts are talking about it, like that is the thing that will drive me more than anything potentially to pick up um, an expensive game day one totally uh, and it's and very unhealthy <laughs> yeah yeah it can, it can but, be yeah. but it's it's also like where do you derive the joy from the experience right like mm -hmm. totally. uh, so much of so much of my joy with mario maker was watching other people play mario maker you know um, and it, it's like it exists outside of the game in some ways and i could have got that by not even buying the game myself but a lot of my joy with it was like making my own levels and then watching other people play my levels as well mm. um so so yeah it it, it depends on the experience you're going to get out of the game and like you know the the amount you spend on it versus the amount you get out of it, it it's always going to vary and it's just so it's just so hard to quantify that stuff right like it's really difficult to be like well did i get enough joy out of this experience and that's just when you start having those conversations with yourself it's just like i don't know why am i even thinking about it in this way it's just did i did i have a good time yes did, did it matter that i spent that much if you have the means then no right like if, if, if it is disposable income anyway then fine you know um for that experience that's kind of what you want to do what about smaller games then like what what will convince you to for example death door came out this year and it wasn't mm. on game pass but we both just picked it up straight away because we wanted to play it what is it what's the x factor in, in an indie game that makes you say well i want to play this straight away so depends on the genre if it's a zelda like metroidvania or something potentially open world or story driven i can i can cope by just by seeing like a certain few trailers and being like i'm getting it day one and going for it mm -hmm. if it's a genre that's a little more out of my wheelhouse of what i personally like, like I, i've played lots of metroidvanias that are like sevens and potentially mm -hmm. even some that are sixes and still had a really good time but yes it's because we just like that because we just game, love right? that genre yeah. like we are like that's that's the number one genre on the show arguably like is metroidvania. yeah i think so. we just love metroidvania so like that's that's kind of an exception but a game like death's door the second those reviews dropped and they're like 88 89 or whatever i'm like right doing it playing it gotta go for it like when when there's something i'm already interested in and it gets high 80s on um open critic like i'm a very i'm a real sucker for like checking out some review scores now a game like the pathless i was gonna get that game day one anyway and the reviews for that were like shockingly low in my opinion like i think mm. they were like 78 79 and i thought that was like a high 80s easily game like personally for me nine out of ten higher kind of game yeah so if i'm already sold on the game review scores don't matter if i'm almost there with a game like death's door i was almost there almost and then the reviews hit and i was like right gotta do it you know like and i'm trying to think of games on the horizon a moon bay is a good example if that suddenly got sixes out of tens i'd be like i'm not so sure but yeah again it's on game pass so that would also mean that i'd probably try it anyway but right. if it gets sevens or eights out of ten i'm i'm there day one like seven or eight out of yeah. ten for a game i'm already interested in uh that's doing something different and unique that i need to experience i feel like i can i can go slightly lower but I, I i am quite conscious of review scores and maybe that's also a bit unhealthy potentially but I, you know you you know what you like right and, and that will also indicate a thing that you'll want to jump on straight away um i think mm. 12 minutes is a really good example of this really where good, yeah. i think i was very interested in it beforehand then people talked about it and they were like well this feels like a really obscure adventure game yeah. at points that's frustrating and i hate that shit that is yeah. like my least favorite <laughs> yeah. stuff so when i hear that i'm like uh but then again it's on game pass so i did give it a go i played like an hour you? of that game um yeah and and it is janky and weird but i did kind of enjoy it but i do foresee myself if i went back to it being like okay i'm gonna hit a point here where i have no idea what to do i'm repeating this loop again and again and i just don't i'm just not having fun so what's the point in pushing on with a game like that when you're just not going to get a good experience out of it yeah. but that's also another factor of a zeitgeist in a different way where like this game supposedly has a wild story and there are a bunch of spoiler casts on my podcast feed that i do want to listen to at some point do i make the executive decision to 
not play the game and just listen to people talk about yeah. it instead um or do i want to go back and experience it for yeah. myself and I, I, and what's the worth like value in that and then that's not even down to price at this point this is down to like how do you value your time with yeah, video games which you're not weird. really talking and there's about like a much. four hour four or five hour game as well which is like because i have heard enough where i'm like i don't want to play this game but then on like uh dan reichert's podcast um fire fire escape fire escape, fire escape um, yeah they're like right we're gonna spoil 12 minutes i was like i can't listen to it i, can't, I couldn't do yeah. it like i couldn't like it's still in that weird middle ground where like i don't want to play this but i want to play this i like I, I it's that it's that urge to be part of the zeitgeist it's that it's that need and longing for like i want to enjoy it i want to have my own take i want to listen to the spoiler cast i want to see what's going on um it's almost like a, a, a mini more controversial last of us part two in a weird way where it's like it's already there it's four hours it's controversial people love and hate it well not many people love it to be fair but um it's it's kind of just it's there and i want to experience it but i i you're right i don't want the jank of that what i've heard about that game you know like it, mm-hmm. that, that sounds annoying yeah for sure it's it's a it's an interesting one but i guess um getting back to like cost of games and, and what affects me buying stuff a lot of it also comes down to can i find a good deal um that is for me i'm very much the type of person my dad kind of has drilled this into us <laughs> as kids of like he will go to if he's going to buy something new like a piece of technology or whatever he will spend at least like three weeks researching making sure he knows exactly what he wants making sure he gets the best possible deal out of anything and that is how i have been brought up so that is my <laughs> mindset when it comes to because buying you're games. the value that time you're putting in into the three weeks the, 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 yes the time is not limitless in terms of price as well you know like that's time yeah. that could have been spent doing you know like so i, I don't much that, more on the yeah. other side where i'm like i'll pay i'll pay a premium to make this experience easier like i will yes. totally be up for that totally and, and yeah and, and and we have conversations apart of like bye you paid so much for that why do you do that and you're like i don't care i just want to get it i want to have it easy hey, hey i still got my ps5 cheaper than you you right? did you really did I right? I made it, that's the one time i've made a, a fucking irrational as fuck decision <laughs> that and, was the uh, most non NBZ thing you have ever yeah, done uh-huh, it, it really is things. and i still need to sell this fucking extra dual sensors <laughs> in my cupboard if anyone wants to buy it please contact the show uh, i need to get rid of that dual sense um but yes, no, I, I I totally appreciate that, and it, it, for so many people, it's it's that type of thing. It's like why why piracy has has gone away a bit is stuff like Netflix making if you you need to be easier than free. It's a thing Jeff Gersman said uh, years so ago. Important. Like, yeah. you have to like be more accessible than uh, piracy, right? Um, and and that's kind of uh, I guess the mentality when it comes to most people with with movies of like, oh, I could watch this thing on Amazon and pay five quid for it. Sure, why not? It's there. It's easy. Um, and and that works. Uh, I am less like that, and that's just just the way I, my my mind works and the way that I, I look for things. So I will always be happy if like, for example, Axiom Verge two and Eastwood, both games that I was gonna buy day one anyway just because i'm interested in them but they both have launch discounts on switch which is great like that's just an added bonus Not, yeah um, launch discounts that's a, that is a killer um death store also had one we should say but um yeah, yeah they they really pushed me over the edge quite easily even even 10 or 15 percent it's like well it's on sale now it won't probably go on sale mm-hmm. again for at least another four months right so you're ske- you're ske- specking it out of like how long will i wait until this will go on sale again and 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 it changes between games of like i, I always have i keep an, a close eye on my steam wish list and my switch eShop wish list to see what's on sale now um w- will it go do i think it will go lower do i need to get it now uh the answer to which is always probably no because i have way too many games to play but still irrational decisions uh, exist um and and yeah and, and when it comes to the bigger games it's i will i will scour these other websites i don't think i've bought a game from amazon in like a couple of years because amazon is just a baseline price and Mm. there's convenience there which i know that's why you go there all the time because you get the prime stuff and it's day one and it's guaranteed but all these other two have been good to me though and they they definitely they've now got a new day one guarantee thing that i don't know if you've seen this but yeah i did like, see that yeah they're like they're, they're kind of brand themselves as like we're the we're the gamers um, yeah. kind of uh outlet you know like we, we yes. really know gamers it's like we know how important to you day one games are so if our, our game doesn't make it to you day one you can get this discount or something basically totally but, yeah um and they are they are really good and as you say they're normally a good few quid cheaper than amazon um 
Yes. And have invariably arrived day one for me so far. So that's good. Yeah. And, and I've never had like a terrible, I've had maybe one bad experience, but that was with my fucking Xbox controller that for some reason oh, got pinged around the country a hundred times and never ended <laughs> up with me. Lost, um, which was fine because like it's not like an important day one game or anything that I no. wanted to play. Um, and that has not happened to me either. But yeah, uh, places like Base or Shop 2 or the Game Collection or all these different websites, I will look through all of them and see which one has the lowest price. I'll go with that one. Uh, and that's generally yeah. how I, I decide in terms of of where i get stuff from and people will be screaming into their podcast playing apps why aren't you buying digital for these day one releases and the answer is that well, in the Bally. uk there is still a big discrepancy between massive, yeah, um, massive digital and and there physical. was a time when shop two were doing digital switch codes and it was amazing i was like this is the greatest thing of mm. all time it's 10 quid cheaper than the e-shop sometimes 20 quid cheaper than the e-shop and then nintendo of europe came in and were like Mm, nah we're not doing that anymore can't do that anymore yeah. so um that and sucks to be fair like day one ratchet and clank for example i'm sure is 70 quid on the playstation shop so yes, maybe that's is. the exception where maybe i could just get it digitally but then the playstation storage is so low and i i'm not that into physical games but hey i don't mind owning like a physical copy of right like that's kind of cool to own so like yeah. at that point you're kind of just i'm too far down the well of like you know getting physical day one especially for like sony triple yeah. a whatever and I, I do appreciate at least being in the uk there is competition in the market whereas i understand it in the us that doesn't exist it's just 60 dollars wherever you go day one and there's not really there is just a general rrp that just applies across the board mm. versus here where they don't really have i mean they kind of have one but retailers will undercut it all the and I time i spent like 45 50 quid on captain toad game that was tragic <laughs> God. i did the same for 3d world oh, uh similar tragic. like oh yeah that was that was hard lines i can't um, remember why that happened it was just so awfully like there was just some miscommunication on the price yeah. of that game and yeah it was stupid but yeah. yeah it's it's rough out there but um but yeah i i think generally we just spend a lot of fucking money on video games but it's fine because it's something we like doing uh, mm. and uh, it brings us joy and, and it's good and um, yeah and really if I did want to switch over to um, books being my main hobby uh, I probably would have a ton more money but I don't think I'd really do anything with it so to, to be fair it's, <laughs> it is uh, it's going to a place where uh, at yeah. least people are getting paid uh, you know so do you think cool. the hobby is getting more expensive well I mean inevitably right with <sighs> inevitably in some ways and in others no That's, it's weird it's really weird yeah because like, some things are getting so cheap like game pass and yeah day one you have sales. you have these two camps which is sony and microsoft doing different things nintendo always kind of staying the same and i do wonder if a new console from nintendo would give them the impetus to up their pricing on games but for so long especially on wii u i remember i got splatoon for 25 quid on amazon day one for splatoon it was absurd. Like, there was an era on the Wii U where... Oh, right, Wii U. I was so confused. Yeah. No, yeah, not Splatoon really 2. Weird. Splatoon 1, yeah. And yeah. Um, when Nintendo games were just a lot cheaper, and then they've jumped a bit going to Switch, but now that Sony have made the 70 jump, it's just like, jeez, man, I just don't... I just don't know whether I can hack it. And, and so unless I find, like, a good... Like, Lost Judgment, I got for 38 quid. And I was like, hell yeah, dude. I feel like I'm I'm fucking them over, even though that's like a regular price for a PS4 game, you know, um, it's at least here. So, so yeah, it, it it has really changed, I guess, perception of games and and how much they cost. But yeah, on the other side, you got Microsoft who are like, fucking don't buy our games, just subscribe to this thing for the rest of your life, uh, and we don't care. And that's incredible. Like Game Pass is just absurd and has really flipped, I think, a lot of people's perception on value. Uh, which could be dangerous potentially um but i don't know it feels like a direction that so many other industries have gone in from music to tv and movies mm. that like it felt inevitable that it was gonna happen with games uh, and now that it's here i don't know that i want to go back you know when um, when i first heard about game pass what, what, 2017 was it did it launch 2016 something like that yeah and I did not. I did not like the idea. I was like, "Oh no, we're going subscription for games." I don't you like. Just won't this. own anything. Yeah, no. I don't. Yeah. I I like to own things in a weird way, even though I'm not really a collector. But yeah. I like to, own, and it's just like I like that fixed cost or whatever. But then when you just kind of view it as I play an absolute ton of games on my Xbox, and if I view that as ninety six pounds a year, it feels. I could play Halo and Forza this November, December, and I would have would have had my value, not including the 
20 odd games i've played up until that point in a in a, in a different world right you would have been paying 70 quid for both of those day one exactly. and already that's like 50 quid more than one year of game pass yeah. which is for two games which right wild. Like... and those games will they they are the exception to like everyone argues like xbox they not haven't don't have enough quality games it's like perhaps but if you argue that like of their quality games those are perhaps the two best games halo and forza like that is such a bargain and it's wild that they're coming out like two months apart like you could get two months of game pass and experience those games and then just pack it in for 2022 if you really wanted like it's crazy good value yeah um and at the very least bali we don't buy amiibos you know so i mean there are so many people who are paying a lot (laughs) of money uh to just have a full amiibo collection you know yeah i i'm so happy i don't have the collector's bug to the degree where I, my house is just oozing with nintendo knickknacks and things yeah because, yeah, yeah. Like, like brian brian altano's desk over here you know like right kind of <laughs> yeah. thing, right there's a level of like tasteful uh you know where you uh, like you've got a few things um I, but I just want a few things gotta yeah. gotta gotta show my 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 pride in nintendo for sure but i don't mm-hmm. want it to you know um come out of every single cupboard and drawer and yeah <laughs> yeah yep. for sure for sure cool uh well i think that's uh covered a lot of uh our thoughts on games and pricing and and all that sort of stuff and i'm sure it will continue to be a conversation that people have uh, as generations go on and uh yeah i'm interested to see what nintendo's approach is uh with their next console but uh, that is uh, a long time away uh, and uh we'll talk about that then for now let's close out the show bally it is the end here uh and uh yeah we're back we're back to uh, a regular cadence i think hopefully uh should be too many other um pre-recordings going on um in the near future so so that's good stuff and uh we have lots of video games coming out from nintendo as well to to be chatting about so i'm excited it's going to be very soon bali one month until metroid dread oh i'm looking forward to it uh, we I'm looking like to nintendo it. alone we've got eastward september 16th we've got super monkey ball banana mania october 5th metroid dread yeah. october 8th like that <laughs> three days after Mar- yeah. monkey ball um, Deadly, man. and then obviously got like advanced wars reboot mm-hmm. camp come december yeah. which is it's gonna be great yeah absolutely uh, i'm really excited uh, and uh, lots of fun things to be chatting about uh, but uh, yeah let's get on out of here and plug some things and talk about some stuff uh bali we have a uh, patreon where people so kindly support the show uh, and uh, you can go over to this nintendo life uh, on patreon it's patreon.com slash this nintendo life uh, where you can uh, support the show if you wish and get some extra episodes and fun things stuff like that uh bally we would like to uh thank some of our supporters and also shout out a new patron yes we have a new patron robert w thank you so much for your your new patronage it's hugely appreciated but we'd also like to thank our ten dollar tier patrons uh, they are zach s atari alex thomas matthew and i can finally say mbz here we go wi- my wife caroline there, there we, we go. go round of applause well done uh we didn't uh, maybe we did i don't know we we're recording this out of order uh, maybe we did talk about the wedding at the start of the show but uh it was good i enjoyed it it was a fun time um, yeah and, yeah uh, yeah good stuff uh congratulations bali thank you well, well done yeah good achievement was a great uh, achievement unlocked achievement. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. um cool we uh obviously can be found all over the internet we're on twitter um bali where can people find you Please find me on Twitter at Ballyman91. That's B A L L Y M A N 91. Um, I posted a good graph for Labor Day in, the, in North America. Yes. It was yes. Basically, this graph shows, um, I think I got it from David Sirota on Twitter, who's like a former Bernie Sanders advisor, I believe. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's basically showing that as wealth has concentrated. Uh, over the years um, since the 1970s at the same time that has increased union membership has declined so I, yep. I, I encouraged everyone to join a trade union to try and uh, redistribute yeah. the wealth that was my, yeah. my message for Labour Day eat the so rich there motherfuckers there we go um, you know it that's yeah that makes sense uh yes you can uh you can find me uh on twitter as well uh not as spicy as bally there with that, <laughs> that hot take um but uh so there's, there's, there's some different spicy hot takes i'm sure uh at lord nbz uh, is where you can find me you can find the podcast twitter at tnl podcast uh, where we show uh updates for things we're doing uh, put out calls for emails that type of thing uh, so check us out on there uh, you can find the show uh, in various different places we're on spotify we're on stitcher we're on uh, apple Podcasts. you can download us uh, you can uh, subscribe you can uh, of course write us a review um for 2021 still waiting on a 2021 review 
will you be the one to do it who knows Uh, get on out there uh, and yes we'll read those on the show if we do uh, get one that'd be great Um, cool I uh, I think that's pretty much it Um, anything that I've forgotten Bali I guess go to the YouTube channel youtube.com slash this Nintendo Life if you prefer to watch on there Um, go to our Discord check that out Uh, we've got people chatting in there about various things Uh, it's a fun time Um, all linked in the description of course and I uh, just want an extra month of time to catch up on some games that's what i, I really think need so right yeah that's what I need. yeah yeah there's de- definitely it was good to go away for that week but then i didn't really get any video games yeah. <laughs> done and the uh, podcasts which... were just spiraling out of control oh my God. And yeah, it's, oh, it was a nightmare yeah um but yes well i'm sure we'll somehow get our way back on track <laughs> and I, I look forward to it i look forward to the the uh, end of the year as, as things barrel towards us and we close things out here um cool well that's going to do us thank you everybody for listening we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with some more video game chat and some more nintendo stuff and uh all those good things we'll see you very soon bye bye folks interludes used on today's show were Silver Pipes from Axiom Verge 2, copyright Tom Hap 2021, and Objection from The Great Eight Attorney Chronicles, copyright Capcom 2021.